Well, Nitro, number 90, also June 2nd, Scott Hall and Six opened the show in the ring. Kevin Nash was not there for whatever reason, so Hall's got both tag belts. Hall says the fans are demanding more NWO. They brag about beating up Ric Flair, Roddy Piper, and Kevin Green in that match they lost. Made some dinosaur jokes, said Flair had lost a step. They called Flair out. Instead, out come J.J. Dillon. He explained that Flair was in his Learjet, headed to Nitro. Six says, that's cool. I'll wrestle them again. JJ says, no, it's going to be Ric Flair against Scott Hall. Hall says, no, no, no. My partner and I, we will face Flair at the bash. And Dylan says, if you refuse that match tonight, I'm going to strip you and your partner of the tag belts. And so Hall took the match and he ran down Flair. All right, so I've got the information here. The Craig contest, if I recall correctly, was the out-of-context contest. Correct. Okay. We had three entries. So of the three people that took the time to enter, one of them is going to get a Cerro Miedo Pentagon Jr. hat autographed, autographed, autographed by Pentagon. Oh, I thought you were going to say the three of us. Courtesy of LuchaShop.com. So everybody listening to this right now going... Oh my god, I would have loved to have had a Pentagon Jr. Cerro Miedo hat autographed by Pentagon, courtesy of LuchaShop.com. If only I'd known. Too bad. You should have entered the contest. I'm going to play the three here at the end. We'll pick a winner. That's a goddamn big prize there. It's very cool. Glacier versus Alex Wright. Short but fun. Alex Wright's a new vicious heel, so he jumped Glacier the bell and worked him over. He's a heel. Yeah. I don't know if I'd call him a vicious heel. Yeah, hmm. More than usual? <laughs> he's more than usual dancing he geek did, Alex Wright. He's Once he took... Oh, well, <laughs> he's a, such a geek. Come on. <laughs> Come on, Vinny. He was Just because he put you in a locker in high school doesn't mean he's vicious. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a geek. I want to fit in the locker. He wasn't a geek. <laughs> in high school, you taken out. In high school, they could have slid you through that slit in the locker. That's true. I was actually... That very, air vent. I was very tall and skinny in high school. Uh, so Glacier used some karate and hit the cryonic kick and won. You looked like a palm tree when you were in high school. <laughs> you look like going to Bailey. Have you seen O'Brien. a palm tree? <laughs> I have one in the fucking backyard. You look like one of Bailey's balloon men. That's closer. There we go. That's closer. Same hairdo. <laughs> Am I wrong? You right didn't see now? me in high school. Did, oh, yeah, I, I forgot. I to school with him. Anyway, so, yeah, uh, Glacier won. And then Mortis and Wrath jumped him, and he made his own comeback. He beat him up. They rang the bell 700,000 million times. It was very aggravating. And at the end, it accomplished nothing. Yep. I got nothing to add. You about covered it. <laughs> Tony Schiavone. Does Remember, not- they're fighting over a hat. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Maybe Pentagon. I was going to say, I got a, I got a hat they could fight oh, over. Three-year-old Pentagon. I got three guys that. fighting it over right now. <laughs> Wrath, Mortis. Exactly. Glacier. Wouldn't that be funny? <laughs> Tony Schiavone promised that Flair versus Hall with nothing on the line would be the biggest main event in Nitro history. It's Drew, John, and Josiah are fighting over this hat. No, Brian. That's not Wrath, no Mortis, Ray. and... You know what I noticed about Mortis? I realized he was Canyon. Right. But if you didn't know any better and you just watched the guy, you'd think he was Seth Rollins. Yeah, sure. Joe Gomez versus Buff Bagwell. Somebody still has a job. Joe Gomez was a horrible wrestler. Oh, fuck, he was horrible. Oh, my God. And Buff his... looked like a cartoon character. Gomez worked like a cartoon character. You know, a t- badly drawn cartoon character. You know, Terry Funk always talks about never trust a man whose ass is bigger than his shoulders. Joe Gomez. Joe Gomez a has a, had at least a very disproportionately large ass. I don't like to make fun of people's physical appearance or anything. <laughs> Go ahead. This, this is new. <laughs> I couldn't even say it with a straight face. Have you guys seen Buff Bagwell recently? 
I'm afraid so. He's 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 old now, but like he's got. Where did you see him? He's got the same hairdo. He's been in media. He's been <laughs> making films. He's been around. Yeah, you know, WrestleCon. You took the time to watch. That, he's, didn't you? he's got it. He's got like the. He's got the same. It's kind of a bowl cut he, hairdo. Yes, yes. and it's, it's all very down. straight. It's it's very straight, very slicked down to cover up his very obvious hair plugs. And his his eyebrows are very like you know. And then his mustache is very intricately drawn. Mm-hmm. Now, what I'm trying to say here is he looks like a wax statue now. Right? Yes. Okay. I watch him on this show. He looks exactly the same. Right. He looked like a wax statue in 1997. Except in this match, God only knows why he was wearing a choker. Because he's, he's Buff, Buff Bagwell. Bagwell. Who wears a choker? Buff Besides Bagwell. Besides women. Let me tell you what's notable about his choker and Buff Bagwell. <laughs> this is what upset you on these two shows. <laughs> Is it just me, or is it absolutely awesome that a badass man's man like Scott Norton hangs out with Buff Bagwell? Absolutely, you're right. <laughs> They're buddies. Vicious and Delicious was a great team for that very reason. <laughs> it's amazing. Scott Norton, if you watch it, if you've ever seen Scott Norton for two minutes, you can tell this man likes three things. Drinking, eating, and lifting heavy things. Sure. Buff is the total pretty boy. Yeah. That's why they're such a great combo. They have it, nothing in common. Exactly. It's impossible to imagine they would hang out together, but apparently they do, and they're best buds. So they had an awful match because Joe Gomez fucking sucks, <laughs> and Buff, Buff him with the blockbuster. Hugh Morris came out for a match. <laughs> he was immediately jumped and laid out by Conan. He hit him with a broom. He broke a broom over his head. A broom. Well, it was there. Maybe he got it from Dean Ambrose's cage. I, he couldn't find a gun. I see. But there was a broom. Well, if I was looking for something backstage, I'd expect to find a broom more than I'd find a gun. Chair wasn't available? No. A broom. So he runs away. The trainers are checking on Hugh. He insists on going to the ring. And even the announcers, like Larry Zabisco says, this isn't smart. And he gets in there, and the ref's checking him. Larry says, the ref should throw this match out. Tony says he may have a concussion. He may have a concussion. Then the match started. It's Hugh Morris versus Prince Iakea. I believe they both had concussions. This was fucking awful. They crammed a ridiculous amount of suck into a one-minute match. <laughs> uh, Iakea won with a schoolboy. And then Conan came out to gloat about Hugh's loss. Yeah. Conan dressed like the Hamburglar. <laughs> he comes out and he hits the guy with a broom, as noted. Yeah. And then he flees. Hmm. And then, after the match, he comes back out again to celebrate. This whole thing was just horrible. <laughs> From fucking start to finish, this sucked. Gene interviewed Dylan on the ramp. Dylan announced that Flair had made it to the building and the match with Hall would happen later. He announced the Steiner brothers would be first in line for a tag team title shot after the pay-per-view. Sherry and Harlem Heat came out to protest this, but he would not listen to them. Had a Paige Savage video package. Very cheesy. It was shots of Paige doing wrestling moves to guys in a barely lit ring. As he talked about losing his first 79 matches of his career. Then he diamond cuttered a bunch of dudes and he bragged about main eventing and beating Randy Savage and said he would do it again. Masahiro Chono and the Great Muda versus the Steiner Brothers. The first few minutes here with Scott and Muda one on one were just awesome. And then the Steiners ran wild with clotheslines and suplexes, and that was awesome too. So Chono, Chono accidentally kicks Muda. The Steiners go for the elevated bulldog. Harlem Heat shows up. They whack Rick with a chair. Gee, I wonder why. The J.J. Dillon interview earlier, and Harlem Heat comes out, and they're very upset that they're not the number one contenders. And J.J. flat out says, if the Steiners win tonight, that pretty much cements them as the number one contenders. I see. Mm. I was like, why don't you just tell them to interfere, dude? You numbskull. They did exactly what you'd expect them to do. They interfered. So Muda slaps Rick in a heel hook, and the ref counts Rick's shoulders down. Harlem Heat and Sherry joined Dylan and Okerlund. God, Dylan was all over the show. Oh, yeah. They said, we should be top contenders now. Dylan says, it will be up for review. You should focus on your up match tonight. You can mm-hmm. just watch it with your own two eyes and see what happened? What is there to review? I don't know. My favorite part about this match was when Rick got the first tag, and he runs in, and he's on all fours, and he's basically trying to bite Muda. Muda's eyes grow wide. He dives out of the ring. And now Steiner is up against the ropes and he's chewing on them as he's barking. Hmm? And Muda, <laughs> the freak that he is, 
is freaked out by this. Yes. This, this, this man man with the headgear is too weird for me. What I loved about this is Scott Steiner obviously greatly respects the Japanese pro wrestlers given his various tours of the Orient, as Mike Tanay calls it. But he is still not afraid to throw their asses all over the ring. Muna came out and he still wasn't even walking good in 1997. Right. His knees were shot in 97. And Scott Steiner did not give a shit. He threw him hither and yon. He lifted him in the air. And he threw him all over the place and nearly killed the guy. Nicely. Is there a place in Norway called Hither and another place called Yon? Norway? I don't know. I'm just asking. I do know that when I went to WrestleCon, Muda had the longest line in the building. Because I don't know what happened, but based on what he was charging for autographs, I think the great Muda, when he was signed for WrestleCon, thought that nobody would care to meet him. And he greatly undercharged. Mm. He was charging like $10 an autograph or something ridiculous. He just had this long line. And you should have seen him walking into the place. He did walk, though. He walked. Okay. Man. Gene interviewed Crazy Flair, <laughs> who confirmed that Nash was not there. And uh, in regards to Scott Hall, he vowed to stomp a mud hole in his, and I quote, toothpick chewing white honky ass. He said a, he was going to stomp a pothole. Mm-hmm. In his oh, you're correct. chewing white honky ass. I typed At least, hole. unlike JBL, he did not say a glory hole. Oh, gosh. JBL said on Monday. Yeah, he did. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> well, that's just unfortunate. <laughs> Oops. I think it was Lance on Twitter. They he, they said a group <laughs> of... Vinny. No, <laughs> no. no. So, so, something I'm, else, I'll tell you. <laughs> they said a, a group of unicorns was called a glory. Okay. And so JBL said... He, they're going to stomp a glory hole in the... Yeah. No, I'm just thinking, it was, it was a year or two ago, the owner of the Dallas Cowboys is a man named Jerry Jones, who is a multi-multi-billionaire. Rich, 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 rich man. His team hasn't fared too well lately. And is, I forget the exact quote, but he says, I, I have seen some good days in my life and some bad days. And he says something like... You think he meant to say, I have seen glory, but what he actually said was, I have seen glory hole. Hmm. And he said, I'm sick of these bad days, and now I want some glory hole. And that is a quote from a billionaire. And the funny thing is, Lance Storm Googled it, and a group of unicorns is actually called a blessing. This exists? (laughs) Apparently, Lance Googled it. (laughs) There is a proper English term for a group of a fictional animal? (laughs) Yeah, what's so weird about that? I, I guess I don't know. <laughs> if you're writing a book about unicorns, you have to have a term for a bunch of them. Fictional. And it has to be the exact same term that other unicorn authors use. Yeah. Can't have one guy calling them a herd of unicorns and one guy no, calling them a flock. No, 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 no. War on. will ensue. Vinny, a unicorn is fictional. You would not have a unicorn with five horns. That's a hydra or some other fucking animal. That, a unicorn has one horn. It's consistent across all fairy tales. Sure. Just like glory. Yes. Or miracle <laughs> needs to be consistent across all unicorn storylines. <laughs> Just going to move on. I didn't say it. JBL did. Don't even look at me. It's brought up on the show today. Observer <laughs> Live. I couldn't believe it. And then people start texting me what a glory hole is. <laughs> like, really? Did it even give you like a, a, a visual aid? And no one sent a link. <laughs> Vinny, uh, stop Googling this. No, no, Not no. right now. I want to make sure I get the Jerry Jones quote right. Yeah. Anyway, I did. M. Wall Street versus Dean Malenko. What a boring ass match. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So in the end, Malenko tries to suplex the guy inside. Jeff Jarrett grabs the old boot. VK falls on top. He didn't Nick, grab the boot. Nick Patrick counts i don't know what the fuck happened but it looked like nick patrick counted the pin Mm -hmm. and everyone sold it like he'd counted the pin which would mean by the way a title change and then nick just decides nah it was a two then he gets in between wall street and the ropes as wall street is stuck in the clover leaf and this is a great controversy nick patrick Shouldn't be in his way, the announcers are screaming. Meanwhile, Patrick's actually in between the guy and the guy on the outside trying to interfere. I'm done with this storyline. Oh, yeah. I'm <laughs> so done with Nick Patrick. But what's with his incompetence? Why did he count a pin? 
I don't know what I, I don't know. And and the why was Jeff is, Jarrett trying to hold Dean Malenko's foot down? And somehow Dean still got a foot on the ropes. That's right, because the whole storyline is Jeff Jarrett wants a rematch for his title against Dean Malenko. So why did you just try and cost him the title? I don't know because it'd be easier to beat Wall Street. So all that happened, a complete disaster. And then Jarrett cuts a promo on Dean, calls him a non-charismatic, boring block of ice. Wow. Isn't that what Glacier said that he was a... <laughs> I think that is Glacier. Yeah. So Dean, <laughs> I think, accepted Jarrett's challenge. Mongo hit the ring to yell at Jarrett. Jarrett ordered Deborah to leave. Mongo said, no, we're married. Mongo runs down Kevin Green. And then finally ended. Now, in this segment, Mongo, Jarrett, Deborah, Malenko. I think I'm forgetting somebody. Wall Street. W- Wall Street. Thank you. Are any of these people heel heels or are all of them heels? Because I don't know where either any of them stand. Well, it appears that VK is a heel because he turned on WCW. It's not the, NWO, though. The NWO doesn't want him, so he's got to wear that stupid shirt to let the world know that I don't like WCW. But the cool guys don't want me either. So I'm a total outcast. I think he's definitely a heel. Malenko's a baby face. And Jared Mongo and Deborah, I have no idea. Okay. Sequel Pay and Damien versus Harlem Heat. And one of those matches that you can't believe actually happened. Oh, I believed it. Here's, a, here's the match. Harlem Heat beat them up for a long time. Damien hit like two dives, just throwing his body all over the place. This pissed Harlem Heat off. They beat him up some more. So everyone's brawling everywhere. Cyclope somehow ends up stuck in the apron. Stevie Ray is openly helping him get out. Cyclope's leg gets caught in the apron. Yeah. The referee goes to try to help him out along with his partner. Because it takes two men to try to get Cyclope's leg out from the apron. Yeah, it, this isn't just the, the fancy covering around the outside. This is actually in between the foam and whatever else is under there. Because I've never put together a ring, Vinny. The ref is trying so hard (laughs) to get this guy's leg out that he misses two giant Steiner brothers wielding chairs, (laughs) weapons, running down to the ring and running rough shot. Yeah. This was so stupid. Oh, yeah. And so then they throw, uh, I guess it's Booker, threw him in and Damien had a stop rope splash for the pin. And one of those wins, that is absolutely nothing to get the victors over. No. And then nobody can figure out who the number one contender should be after the Great American Bash. <laughs> and I was like, shouldn't it be C. Clope and Damien against sure. Chono and Muda? You would think. What that a took novel, me two seconds. What a novel concept. And this match will probably have to be under review by fucking J.J. Dillon. Then he can make some sort of ruling. Lee Marshall did the road report. Made a joke about a sporting event that was 11 years old by the time this show aired. Now, I don't know if Bobby Heenan's a Red Sox fan or what, but he took this one very personally. He was pissed. Barbarian versus Chris Benoit. Match of the year. <laughs> yeah. They were attacking each other with great violence, and then Barbarian grabbed him for like a suplex, and he did a spot that I've seen a thousand times, and honestly, every, t- every time I see guys do this, it always looks like this is going to happen. And this one actually happened. He got him to drop, drop Benoit belly first on the ropes. But he, first of all, he didn't drop him. He threw him threw down. Him. Oh, yeah. He, he threw him with great might. Yes. He threw him like a javelin. Yes, because Benoit's chest and hips did not hit the ropes. His legs did. So his head is now barreling towards the earth. And he was somehow able to like twist in midair and land on his back and shoulders. Wasn't even it wasn't even Benoit. It was when he was dropped over the ropes, Barbarian not only threw him like a javelin, but twisted him as he threw him. So Benoit landed twisted, which is probably the only thing that saved his life. Yeah. I know you love Barbarian, but yeah, he's great. this was very careless. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Look at the guy. He's a barbarian. I understand <laughs> the that. How do you want that out of the guy? Very unprofessional. Technique. So they're having the, the great match continues. Barbarian has a pile driver, and then Benoit has the temerity to fight back. So Barbarian takes him the corner and mauls him like a bear. And finally, Benoit makes his comeback, hits the headbutt, hooks the crossface. There is a long struggle, and Barbarian taps. As Heenan is screaming that the Barbarian will never quit. This man will never quit. He'll never quit. 
And, and he quits. And he quits, but he knew it was awesome. Because he starts screaming more. Unheard of, he says, for the barbarian to submit. Well, it pretty much was. Made it seem like a huge victory for Benoit, which it was supposed to be. Fucking great battle. So the deal is, Benoit is trying to get a match with Sullivan. He tells Jimmy Hart, I beat Barbarian like you asked. Where is my match with Sullivan? Jimmy says, this is only step one. Now, Gene was appalled at that. Hmm. You never said there was more than one step. Step two will be a death match against Meng at the Great American Bash. Okay, Brian, again, I want to ask you, is Sullivan in the company, or is he yes, not? Yes, they're, they're building up to Sullivan Benoit in a retirement match I see. in July. But someone answered me this question. When they challenge for the death match, Gene Okerlund is appalled again, and he says, last time he tore out his thyroid. Yes, he said thyroid. <laughs> what? I think he was trying to say throat or larynx. <laughs> Still, and somehow got thyroid. Dude, who to- who tore out whose thyroid? Ming did it to he put the the tongue the and death grip on on Benoit and tore out his thyroid. Uh, it was a very devastating hold. Oh, man, <laughs> that is devastating. <laughs> I'm surprised Benoit didn't get fat. By the way, just to confirm what I was reporting earlier, I did look up the quote. Jerry Jones told <laughs> reporters, "I've been here when it was glory hole days and when it wasn't." <laughs> I want me some glory hole. That's a festival that people would go to. Wow. You think so? <laughs> well, some people. And yes, I realize that's, I'm going to regret that. Scott Hall versus Ric Flair. Oh, and Jimmy Hart also said next week he reveals step three in this plan to get to Sullivan. That's right. Ben Wise even got through step two yet. I guess it's a foregone conclusion. He's going to beat Ming. Uh, yeah, because of his thyroid. Yes. His, his dreaded thyroid attack. Did Springsteen write a song about glory hole days? He may have. He may have. Scott Hall versus Ric Flair. There's a story to this match. All right. So if you watch this show, it fucking fell off a cliff after this match. Yes. It's a great match. This match was supposed to go till the end of the show. Oh. And of all people, Ric Flair got too tired. And he decided we got to go home early. Called to go home early and they had to stall the rest of the show. Hmm. I don't know what Flair was thinking because he was going 20 thousand miles an hour yeah it was the awesome moment this match started <laughs> it was awesome while it lasted and then all of a sudden you could just see in his face he's like Fuck, i'm tired <laughs> I'm, I'm i don't know what he is now he expended 44? all of his energy on that promo earlier in the show yes so it's the whole thing is basically a handicap match six is interfering so much and fair is going after him so much it's a great handicap match and then again here we have six a man not in the match with a belt which is the weapon he's in the ring I can't say the ref's doing nothing, but he's doing a five count. Yeah, he's in the ring. This isn't even like on Raw where they were outside the ring. Yeah. This was, a, this was the third participant in the ring. Ref is like, hey, buddy, get out. Please. <laughs> so he didn't, and eventually Hall finally hits Flair with a belt, and it's a DQ. This meant more bell ringing. Now, this whole time, by the way, it's been Ric Flair against two men. I'm thinking, okay. We have already seen Jeff Jarrett, Steve McMichael, Chris Benoit, and Deborah all on the show. I know they're there. Why weren't you here during the match? So the beating goes on for a while. Finally, Mongo arrives with the briefcase to chase the NW- NWO away. Jarrett is also out there being useless as usual. And then it ended. And then, yes, everything after this was freaking terrible because they had to call an ending on the fly. And rather than just grab two dudes and say, hey, go do a match, here's what they came up with. The announcers begin to wrap up the show. And I, I thought maybe this sort of thing just went long because I'm looking at the on the network deal. I can see they still got at least 10 minutes left. And suddenly the NWO music hits. Randy Savage is dragging Randy, uh, Gene Orkland out so that Gene can interview him. But Gene is under protest. Gene does not want to do this. This man whose job it is to interview wrestlers does not want to interview this wrestler. This is very humiliating for me, he says to Elizabeth. So Savage is bullying him, threatening to knock him out. They get in the ring, and now Gene goes on a monologue Ugh. about how Savage has underestimated Dallas Page. And Savage says, I am the best ever. He keeps intimidating Gene until out comes J.J. Dillon for the 44th time on the show. <laughs> now Dillon and Savage are going back and forth, and neither of them are saying anything. And then Dillon... 
not quite as old man as you were earlier, but he gets very old man here talking about what a disappointment Savage is. Can't believe you're behaving this way. And Randy rolls his eyes. I'm like, I know, Randy. Fuck, right? And finally, Randy punches him. I thought, good for you. So he's beating up the old fuddy-duddy. Eric Bischoff comes flying down to hold Savage back. And there, there's four guys in there, and half of them are holding Savage back. Half of them are uh, attending to Dylan. Fans chant Paige's name, so Savage snaps again. Goes after Dylan again. It takes four men to hold him back. So still going on. Now Eric has to cut a promo saying, JJ, this is all your fault. You started this. I was so baffled. You provoked Savage. Because Savage attacks Dylan, and Bischoff's running out trying to pull the guy off, going, no, don't do this. Not like this. Not like this. Think about the money. And then two minutes later, he's all happy. Mm -hmm. And he's celebrating, and he's telling JJ this is his fault. Like, what's going on? I have no idea. Shouldn't Savage be fired? Yes. So I guess they're building to Randy Savage versus J.J. Dillon at Fall Brawl, for all I know. Hey. Yeah, Raw was better. Yeah, the show. Realize, I didn't realize what a mess of that show it was at the time. I thought it was just boring. It's because it's because the end, they fell off a cliff. Yeah, it was a mess before that. It was that kind of That Wall a mess. Street Malenko thing was a terrible. The two tag finishes were bad. Raw wasn't anything to write home about either. This was yeah, not a good week for wrestling. I enjoyed it. There was not a lot of good wrestling on Raw, but I enjoyed the show. Right. I love looking back at the fact that I used to bury Nick Patrick every single week for being Mm -hmm. incompetent at his job. Then he joins the NWO as a character, and I praised him. Yes. And now he's left the NWO, and he's back to just being a referee again, and he's incompetent, and he sucks at his job again. Right. I don't know. We are at war! And as I noted very early in this show here today, there were two backstage brawls. The second one wasn't really a brawl. It was a backstage skirmish. And it happened after Nitro went off the air. So we're going to review Nitro, and then I'll talk about what happened and why. And I will try not to bury anybody too badly. Nitro. (laughs) You realize people are paying you to bury people. I know. I don't want to come across like I'm biased. Anyway, I'll talk about it at the end. Otherwise, I'm going to go off. So they announced that Hulk Hogan and Dennis Rodman will, in fact, team up at Bass and the Beach in July. The opponents were not yet named. They cut backstage. Now, this next skit is going to take me about a minute to explain what happened. On TV, it lasted, it felt like, about eight seconds. A limo pulls up. Elizabeth gets out. Randy Savage starts to get out. Dallas Page runs up. And so Savage hides in the limo and slams the door shut. So Paige goes to kick the window in. This takes him three tries. Eventually he gets the glass broken. He opens the door. He goes in to go after Macho Man when Elizabeth runs up and slams the door shut on Paige. Paige goes down. The limo peels off. Paige is left riding on the ground and Liz is left standing there. Right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. It all happened very quickly. Oh, I thought there was, really a, was. I thought there was a point to all of that you were you were saying here. The point is, there's too much happening. It happens fast. Like it, it, I see. I had to stop the show to, to write in detail what went on. All right. Well, let me let me tell you and everybody else the point of all of this. There's two things on this show. One is this, where Diamond Dallas Page goes backstage and he kicks in the window of a limo, a real glass window, by the way, not a fake glass window. And well, the other. But- the other is at the end of the show where Sting straps himself to the cable. He straps Diamond Dallas Page to the cable, and we'll talk about later. They both get pulled up to the ceiling. Now, granted, hindsight is always twenty twenty, but as this wrestling war is escalating, I mean, we can just watch on TV every week all of these things that are going to lead to disaster. I mean, yeah. playing around with glass... I mean, yeah, Diamond Dallas Page didn't get hurt here. But, I mean, watching it, you had to know at the time, you can't be messing around with glass. Just like all those times that they messed around with fire and then eventually somebody got burned really bad. You know what's going to happen. So, obviously, eventually Goldberg nearly sliced his whole goddamn arm off, punching his way through a limo window. And there's a million stories about it. He was supposed to have something in his hand and he forgot it. But it doesn't matter. It was real glass whether he had something in his hand or not. And Owen Hart, the whole Owen Hart death, when you read about the death and the clamp and everything else involved in that, and you think about this guy Sting 
at the end of the show, not only clamped himself in by himself, there was nobody else down there to strap him in. He also had to strap in Diamond Dallas Page, and both of them got pulled to the ceiling. I mean, this is madness. Complete madness. Yeah, I'll have more to say about that when we get there. The opening match was Ultimate Dragon and Juventud Guerrera and Super Galo versus Psychosis and Laparca and Silver King. This was a this was a clusterfuck. Just bodies fired where no one had any idea what was going on. No one had any idea who was on whose team. The announcers had no clue of anything. The guys were moving eight thousand miles an hour, and I think they screwed up half their stuff. But no one—they were moving so fast, no one could tell what was hit and what was missed. Uh, there was a actually a boring chant in here, believe it or not. Oh my god! And, there was one in the next match too. Yep, yep. And the, my my favorite part of this is there's so much going on, and so much haywire, and so much just traffic. The ref is just Brian Hildebrand, and towards the end, he just gives up. And he goes back to what he thinks is a neutral corner, although it's hard to tell at that point. And he just stands back and watches. And you just watch his head go. It's like he's watching ping pong or tennis, just jerking back and forth constantly. And he's doing his best as a try to stay out of the way. Finally, there's a bunch of bodies sitting on the floor, and then a dragon that taps out psychosis would be a dragon at sleeper. As I wrote here, the fluster cuck to end all fluster cucks. I love this match. It was kind of a cluster, but... I've seen some some WCW matches that are just absolute disasters. I thought this one was actually kind of amazing. I mean, there were a Dragon fucked up some spot in the corner, but he kind of saved it by grabbing his leg, and then he started running, so you knew it was a fuck up. But I mean, there were all sorts of crazy dives. There were all sorts of big moves. Monkey flip by La Parka nearly killed himself in the rope. Super Colo with a springboard sent on over the top to the floor. Larry's high spot, which has belittled the wrestlers. Claimed that he wrestled Dr. Wagner and would beat his son Silver King as well. Meanwhile, Silver King is just looking so awesome here in the ring. Just a crazy match, and I thought it was awesome and the best thing on the show. So then there was more after the match when Park went after Kolo with a chair, and then it just stopped. And you liked that a lot more than I did. Lex Luger joined Gene Oakland for a promo. He said he and the Giant wanted to take on Hogan and Rodman. And he reminded everyone that Hogan had not defended his title since February. Now, we were bearing the European title earlier, which is about the same time. Actually, I, I think I think Hogan has defended the championship more recently than that European title. Yeah. But, Although uh, not anymore, yeah. not after tonight. Uh, what was the non-title match? Because, as Luger explained, because he had not defended the title in so long, the WCW was forcing Hogan to wrestle Luger in a non-title match. I'm not really sure how that's that much punishment, but whatever. Well, you you may have misheard it. He actually fucked up, and he said that he was going to be defending the title tonight. And it ended up being a non-title match. And so everybody got confused. Hmm. We had an earlier today, Mike's Navy with Roddy Piper and Rick Flair as they arrived in a limo, and they said they did not want to wait for the pay-per-view. They wanted to fight the Outsiders tonight. So that was going to be the main event of the show. You did a very good job cleaning up what was a totally nonsensical promo by Roddy Piper. I am long past the point of trying to decipher what he actually says and just trying to see what is the nut of what he's saying and try to get to that. That's right. Alex Wright versus Chris Jericho. <laughs> I got to talk about this. They noted that Jericho had just come back from the top of the Super Juniors tournament, which takes place same time every year, by the way. And Jericho did, on Twitter today, put over Will Ospreay, who won the tournament this year. So that's a callback, I guess. Alex Wright is now a full-fledged heel. And as a heel, he is a total mid-card geek, but he entertains the hell out of me with his dancing and his goofy mannerisms. He's got a new one. He does that goofy dance, which, by the way, when you watch it now, and you recall that it actually started out as a babyface deal. It's hilarious. Oh, yeah. He does his goofy dance, and now he shakes his ass on top of everything else. And these guys, it's funny because they were working their asses off. It did go too long for what it was, which was a totally random match between Chris Jericho and Alex Wright. But the fans were chanting boring during this match. And... I don't know. There's a lot of stuff you could chant about this match, but it wasn't boring, and they were trying very, very hard. 
and Alex Wright pinned him with a high cross, or Jericho did a high cross, and Alex Wright rolled through, got his feet on the ropes for the pin, did his goofy dance afterwards. I couldn't believe people were chanting boring for this, and the opener. You and I watched different shows, I think, because I was with the fans. Here's what this match was. Alex Wright was playing the part of, just to pick a name, let's say Ivan Kola. And Chris Jericho was playing Vernon Deaton. I, what the fuck? And, and, uh, and, and Alex Wright beat him up for what felt like 45 minutes. He beat him and beat him and beat him, and Jericho would do like a roll-up. And then Wright would beat him and beat him and beat him, and Jericho would do like a backslide or whatever. And this goes forever and ever and ever, and it's all just Alex Wright beating up Chris Jericho, and then Alex Wright wins! All I can think was, no wonder Jericho wanted out. So let me get this straight. You are comparing Alex Wright to Ivan Koloff and Chris Jericho to Vernon Deaton. It, the names don't matter. The point is, Alex Wright was put into this match like a WCW Saturday Night Superstar, and Chris Jericho was put into this match like a, or I shouldn't say, a, a, like an NWA Championship Wrestling Superstar, and Jericho was put into this match like an NWA Championship Jobber. And Jericho's huh. job was to lose for 99% of this match and then lose at the end. Huh. Well, you know, they're trying to get this Alex Wright guy over for a week. But it's not working. Because <laughs> he's not very good. you got to keep trying. He's, he's adequate. Yes, I thought this, I, I thought this, was, this also sucked. Malaya Hasaka versus Akira Hokuto. All I wrote about this was they did some stuff. Ono distracted Hasaka and Hokuto hit a Northern Lights bomb for the win. All I got out of this was the fans were more tolerant for this match than they were for the previous two matches. That's impossible. Well, the, 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 they botched less stuff than the Luchadors, and they didn't go four hours like Alex Wright and Chris Jericho, so I can see that. So afterwards, uh, Hokuto goes to drop another Northern Lights bomb on Hasaka, and Medusa runs out to make the save, and she makes the save with a series of German suplexes Bridging for the pin on each one. <laughs> she she hits the German, she does a bridge, and then she uses her arm to make sure that her opponent's shoulders are down for a moment, and then she picks yes. her up to do it again, and she does it three times exactly like that. Yes. That was so weird. Oakland brought the Steiners out for a promo. They cannot believe they have been screwed out of the titles by the NWO, and now they had to go through all the teams in the roster again. Harlem Heat came out, they jibber-jabbered, they brawled, they were running all over the place fighting, and finally Geeks came out to separate them. <sighs> Conan versus Steve McMichael. I gotta talk about this for a second. Mongo is on his way to the ring, and a man flies in out of nowhere, like Superman, and he takes out Mongo. It's Kevin Green. Kevin Green, they're they're in the uh, they're in the aisle. By the way, Mongo's down. He's on his way down to the ring. He's in the aisle, and this dude flies in and attacks him. They have a wild brawl, and Mongo beats his ass, <laughs> leaves him laying, and then he yes. he looks at the camera defiantly, and he keeps on heading to the ring because and he's he like, voiced the ring because he still wants to fight Conan. That's right, because he's a badass. And Kevin <laughs> Green jumps him again. All the geeks run down to break it up. I thought Mongo, you know, when you think of the Four Horsemen, the elite group, you really don't think of Mongo in there. But as, a, as the years go by, and especially when you hear Flair talk about what a part of your Mongo was after the shows, it really is kind of like, you know what, this man was a horseman. This man was one of the Andersons here in this little deal. He got jumped, he beat the guy's ass, and he just kept walking to the ring because he wanted to fight tonight, and he didn't give a shit what was going on. He was so great here. Now, that's only half of what happened. Because eventually, the geeks pulled Kevin Green to the back. Eventually, they pulled Mongo apart, and Mongo was no longer fighting with Kevin Green. And then they cut to the ring, and there are three things lying on the mat. Two of them are the separate halves of a broom that has been broken in half, and the third is Conan. The announcers had zero idea what had happened. Right in front of them, mind you. No idea. Larry suggested Conan had fainted. <laughs> Perhaps he fainted onto a broom, which then broke. He was sweeping up the ring, <laughs> and he fainted and broke the broom. So Mongo gives up. He's a, the dude just gives his fight tonight. He goes to the back. 
Then they come back to the ring. Nick Patrick is looking right into the camera, waiting for his cue. They cut to him. There's, you know, the awkward pause that WWE does after promos. Oh yeah. This is the awkward pause before he spoke. There's an awkward pause, and he says, "There is no match. It's a no contest." Thanks, Nick. And here I wrote, "What an overrushed mess of a show this has been so far." Eric Bischoff and Hollywood Hogan came out for a promo. I don't know what movie Hogan was doing where he had to shave, but he apparently shaved clean shaven, totally just didn't bare bare faced. Then grew back just his mustache, and then he had no beard, and so it looked like they painted a beard on him with shoe polish. That's exactly what happened. And I think up to this point, this is my favorite thing on the whole show. The world champion, the biggest star in wrestling is out there with a painted on beard pretending it's normal. <laughs> That's Hulk Hogan. Uh, so he says Luger is not in good enough shape to wrestle him. So he's going to pose and flex instead. And so he does until Luger calmly comes out. And, and shakes his ass. Front. He stole Alex Wright's dance. He has done the ass shaking thing before, but yes, Hogan flexed and shook his ass. And Hogan was always the best at when, when he was when he was a heel and there was somebody behind him and he had to do the slow burn reaction. <laughs> Why is everyone cheering and pointing? I don't understand. And he turns around and sees Luger. He says, Lex, I don't know if you came out here to see what a real body looked like, but you're not going to beat me in the ring. You should leave before I destroy you. And then before Lex could even speak, Bischoff runs down Lex. Finally, I did like how both of the heels, their main line was, if you ever want a shot at me, I suggest that you start working out. Oh, yeah. Very important that he watches the nutrition and training. So eventually Lex punches Bischoff. Hogan goes after Lex. Luger knocks Hogan out of the ring. The Outsiders and Six run out. They're standing by Hogan's side, and the rest comes down, and the bell rings, and the match was on. So it's Hulk Hogan versus Lex Luger in what we eventually learned was a non-title match. Hogan's beating him up for a while. Lex starts his comeback. The Wolfpack tries to attack for the DQ, but he fights off all three of them. He turns around puts the rack on Hogan, and Hogan, for what is quite possibly the first time in his entire career, submits. And this ref, (laughs) when Hogan gives up, the ref calls for the bell by high-stepping in place, like doing high knees, (laughs) pumping his fingers like six guns. Oh, yeah. (laughs) This is the best call for the bell ever. So Luger has just submitted Hulk Hogan, and the Wolfpack jumps him, Hogan starts hitting him with leg drop after leg drop after leg drop. The second hour of power goes off. More legs are being dropped. This goes on and on for a long time. But in the end, it didn't matter. Lex proved, even with it, even if they tried to interfere, he could tap out Hulk Hogan. I thought this was, this was so great. I was disappointed that, A, it aired at the top of the hour. B, it kind of felt rushed. C, Luger got a big submission over Hulk Hogan, which should have been like a real big thing, but they had to get Hulk's heat back immediately and lay out Lex, and then it was like to the back, and we went to the next segment. It just felt like this could have been so much more with all the heat that Hogan had and the NWO had and Luger submitting the guy. It it just kind of felt like they just did it and then moved on. There was no impact to it, ironically. They did take it away, the... the, the, uh... They, uh, they gave him zero seconds to celebrate this. He was down on the mat immediately, and the post down, beat down went too long. Yeah, it's like, why did they? I mean, I don't know. It just. I mean, well, I, 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 I have a guess. I suspect Hogan said, if I'm going to lose via submission to this man, then I must immediately pound him into the earth afterwards. Well, I'm, I'm sure there's that. I'm just wondering why they made the decision to even do this, because it just. Well, it just felt like nothing when it was over, and it should have felt like everything. Yeah. And then. Oh, so they do this post-match brawl, and Hogan drops the big leg on Luger. And, of course, the big leg is Hulk Hogan's finish. And then he drops another leg, and then another leg, and then another leg, and another leg, and another leg. They said he dropped, like, eight legs on the guy. Now, if you imagine that a man's finishing move is so devastating that it can keep a man down for three seconds and maybe longer, that's a pretty devastating move. 
to drop it on a guy seven or eight times, the man should be near death. And they bring the geeks down to the ring, and they grab Lex by the legs, and they just yank his ass out of the ring. To yeah. get out of there. I was like, what the fuck? So if you are crossing it's a person, I know you're trying to help, but don't drag them anywhere by the feet. Oh, my God. Not even like a neck brace or a backboard or nothing. It was just like, grab his legs and yank that dude out of the ring. Oakland brings J.J. Dillon out for an interview. This was JJ a good J.J. interview right here, Vinny. I hope this you was. I hope you apologize for all you've said about J.J. of late. He was good here. This is a much better J.J. interview than we have seen. He announces Randy Savage is being fined $50,000 for attacking J.J. last week. He said they had considered a suspension for Randy, but they did not want to rob, rob Dallas Page of the opportunity to get his hands on Savage at the Great American Bash. He announces the page of Savage 2 will now be no contest, no DQ, falls count anywhere. There must be a winner. And by the way, we talked about the dangerous stuff they were doing with Dallas Page in the show, kicking in windows and taking cables to the ceiling. He was main eventing the next pay-per-view. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Savage appears in the crowd, says he would have no problem paying a $100,000 fine. So Page comes out. He calls Savage Big Mouth. <laughs> there isn't a fight right now. The fighting words. Savage accepts this challenge, and he makes his way down to ringside. Now, I don't want anyone to get hurt. And I think it's, it makes sense to have security holding fans back when guys are going through the crowd or whatever. But when re- watching Randy Savage literally have to fight his way through this crowd, and everyone's trying to get a hand on him, and his shirt gets torn, this looks so awesome. And he jumps the barricade, and Paige comes flying off the apron onto him, and they're brawling, and they immediately go to a break. It was fun. Should have been more of a brawl, but the show had turned around by this point. You know, I love the idea that he challenged... Savage is in the crowd, and Diamond Dallas Page challenges him to a fight, and I'm thinking, Savage ain't going to accept because he's a heel. But then he did. And it didn't take anything away from it because Randy Savage's character, even though Randy Savage's character is a heel, his character is a crazed madman. Yeah. And so, of course, he's going to come down and go through the crowd. And the thing about going through the crowd, too, is I don't know what would happen if somebody punched Roman Reigns. I, I suspect that Roman Reigns could hold his own and would probably scare the hell out of everybody around him. But I think these fans knew... You know, it's okay to grab Savage, maybe pull on his shirt a little bit, but don't try anything because this dude will go crazy. This guy will oh, yes. lose his mind on you. And so he if had I no... If Randy Savage, he's going to wipe out this entire section. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Savage was amazing. Me Marshall did the road report, told some joke about Jerry Springer. I don't know. Jeff Jarrett versus Dean Malenko. I laughed because... They're doing this, like a pre-match stare-down thing where Jarrett's pointing his finger in Dean's chest and Dean is swiping it away. Meanwhile, Shivani's talking about how much they respect each other. They had a fun technical match, and Jarrett hits a top rope suplex. They're both down selling. The ref checks on Jarrett when who should appear but Eddie Guerrero. He comes through the crowd with his arm in a sling. He hits a frog splash on Dean. Then he takes the sling off, leaves it on Dean, and he leaves. Ref turns around, just sees Dean laid out with a sling on him, doesn't know what happened. And so Jarrett puts the figure four on, and Dean submits. So Jeff Jarrett is the new U.S. champion via Eddie Guerrero interference. You know, as we watch these shows back, there's guys that some of them I knew were good, but I didn't realize how good they were. Dean Malenko is a great example. Like, I always knew Dean Malenko was good, but watching him in 2016, I realized... This guy was unbelievable. And there are other guys that I watch, and I realize, you know what? I didn't give this guy enough credit when I was younger. He's a much better worker than I thought he was. Do you remember in the 90s when Matt Farmer was always on me about Jeff Jarrett? Matt Matt was a bigger fan of Jarrett than you were then. That is true. And how Jarrett was so awesome, and Jarrett was better than Shawn Michaels, and all these crazy things he said about Jeff Jarrett. No disrespect I, I, to Jeff Jarrett. But looking back in 2016, he's exactly what I thought he was in 1997. 
He was wow. a very good worker. He was not better than Shawn Michaels. I still, in 2016, don't have any idea what Matt Farmer was talking about. I think, except for the better than Shawn Michaels part, I think I would I, I, I would be more on that side. I thought he was very good. He was very good. I never said he wasn't very good. He was not better than Shawn Michaels. He was not better than Shawn Michaels. He was not like an all-time great worker. He was a very good wrestler. I, I did watch this thinking, boy, but having a match with Jarrett would be fun. Yeah, sure. I'd love to have a match with the guy. Yeah. I'd rather wrestle Jeff Jarrett than Dean Malenko. At least I know he could keep up. Wow. It's not even like a negative. I'm just telling you. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that Dean Malenko could carry me. But I'd have to work a hell of a lot harder than a match with Jeff Jarrett. I'd probably get a better reaction wrestling Jeff Jarrett. Okerlund interviewed Jimmy Hart in the Faces of Fear. Now, as I recall... Chris Benoit wants to match with Kevin Sullivan. And so Oakland said first you had to beat the Barbarian, and Benoit did. And then Jimmy Hart said, Ming, now there'll be a step two, you'll have to beat Ming. And then <laughs> next week, I'll reveal step three. Yeah. So he's out of the phase of the fear. He says, it's time to reveal that third step. And the third step is Kevin <laughs> Sullivan. <laughs> because you see, he must beat Kevin Sullivan in order to get a match with Kevin Sullivan. It's like getting a SAG card. <laughs> yes. You have to get a job before you get a card, and you have to get a card before you get a job. So they were in Boston. Sullivan talks about being home at last. and says Benoit's taking everything from him. He's not going to take his hometown. There's Benoit to come fight right now. Benoit does. And it, this is actually awesome because for about 10 or 15 seconds, the heels put on pretenses of letting this be a one-on-one fight. Sullivan wanted to fight Benoit by himself. Benoit comes out there trading punches, and first the guys stop and watch. And then Jackie jumps on Benoit's back, but Ming steps up to pull her off because they want to let Sullivan settle himself. And then Ming turns around and puts Benoit on the Tongan death grip, and it becomes a five-on-one beatdown, including Jimmy Hart. Now all I can think of was, thank God the horsemen are here to watch Benoit's back. So the main event, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall versus Ric Flair and Roddy Piper. And may I... Have at it. I don't want to come across biased against Kevin Nash. I know I say a lot of things about Kevin Nash, and I'm going to say more about him here. But I'm just trying to be fair, and I'm trying to be a reporter here. So after this match, Roddy Piper and Ric Flair versus Hall and Nash, non-title match. After the match, there is a dressing room altercation. Where Kevin Nash goes to Roddy Piper's dressing room, and he bangs on the door. Roddy Piper's lackey opens the door. Nash storms in. He pie faces Roddy Piper. Roddy Piper tries to kick out his bad leg. All of these guys come in. They separate everybody. And Kevin Nash's whole issue, the reason that he's had this issue with Roddy Piper, they, they'd had some issues here and there. It was, it was a little bit like Brett and Sean, but not that kind of heat, and it, wasn't, it hadn't gone on for that long. They'd, they'd not been on the same page for a little while, but Nash apparently was just so mad about this main event and how horrible it was and how Roddy Piper had ruined the match that he had to go in there and start a fight. Now, in The Observer, Dave called this maybe the worst match of the year. Clearly, standards have changed between 1997 and 2016. I have seen a thousand television matches exactly this bad over the last decade. This was not one of the worst matches I've ever seen. Furthermore, as I watch this match, Roddy Piper is old, and he's got one hip. But was he really that bad in this match? No. And when you watch the match, you can just see that Kevin Nash has got a chip on his shoulder. He's annoyed, like, the whole time. Like, everything that happens, he's upset with. Now, they did have a... Once they did the finish here, which was, of course, the NWO running in in a DQ, they had this big post-match deal. I guess the match was supposed to go 12 minutes, and just like last week, somebody got tired. Roddy Piper called for the finish early. They only went six minutes, so they had to extend this brawl here at the end. Which meant oh, we got God. six minutes of this fucker ringing the bell a thousand times. Uh, nine million. The show. Yeah, there's nine million people running in. But the point of this is, during that schmoz, Roddy Piper and Kevin Nash were 
together in a corner doing something again. And maybe that's what happened. I don't know. I will say, to be fair, to be impartial, as a wrestler, there were many times where I had matches, and in the middle of the match, I thought, this fucking match sucks. I am so angry. If I could beat this guy's ass for real, I would. It's all his fault. I'm pissed off, and I'm in a bad mood. And then later I go back and watch it, and you know what? It wasn't that bad. And maybe that was a situation here that when it was happening, Nash thought it was a thousand times worse than it actually was, especially in the post-match brawl where nobody was paying any attention to Kevin Nash and Roddy Piper anyway. Nobody was even watching them when all of this went down, if something went down then. So I can understand that maybe Nash got a little bit worked up about something that wasn't quite as bad as it, as it seemed. Still, I never went to somebody's locker room and got in their face and pie-faced them ever in my whole career. This whole thing with Nash and Piper here, it's so unprofessional. Like, it's amazing to watch. You watched the match, Vinny. It was not that bad. It was... It was every Raw main event tag you would see these days. I just thought it was funny because this was... I don't know if maybe Nash was angry before the match started, but they, again, this was like the Alex Wright match, but they took 99% of the match. In fact, this was even 100% because they were building up with a hot tag when they did the DQ. So it wasn't even a comeback. But yeah, um, they did a match. It was forgettable. And yeah, that's it. Was, it was forgettable. Yeah, it wasn't the was worst the match of the year. It wasn't horrible. No. It was like Nash was just looking for an excuse to start a fight. Well, that's possible, too. That's possible, too. And now the post-match was much worse than the match itself. And if that's due to the match being cut short, then I kind of understand being, Nash being angry. But they had hundreds of men out there fighting Glacier and Mortis and Wrath. I did enjoy it. It only lasted a series of about four seconds, but at one point there was a three-way brawl between Kevin Green, Mongo, and Scott Norton, which was so manly. <laughs> of course they would end up long. together. Yes. Sullivan's out there in the faces of fear and Benoit. So Savage, it, it, it's such a mess. Do you remember? Do you remember the tag match with Samito, where he got the hot tag and hit oh, an yeah. empty ring? Oh yeah, and shouted, "I'm a house of fire, and there's no one to fight. <laughs> there's nobody to hit. There's nobody to hit." That's what Savage did here. He goes running out there, hit rolls into the ropes, stands up, and just looks around, and he's got nothing to do. So then Paige comes out. Paige comes out to jump Savage. And Hall and Nash are watching. And very briefly, they make it a three-on-one. It's Hall and Nash and Savage and Paige. And I don't know if Paige said, go away, I've got to do a spot, or if they just got bored. But in the middle of this, Hall and Nash just walk away. And they walk to the corner, and they're just having a chat as Randy Savage leaves, or excuse me, as Dallas Paige leaves out Randy Savage with a face burst. So Hogan comes out, and he starts whacking people with his belt, and Paige gets knocked out of the ring to the floor, and finally Sting descends from the ceiling. And we talked about this earlier. Now, the last time we saw Sting do this, where he descended, did some stuff, and then reascended, the whole time he was getting ready to reascend, the camera zoomed in on everyone else. So Craig and I suggested maybe off-camera two or three guys had run up and helped him get hooked up into his heart. I told you, dude. I tried to tell you. Well, Sting descends. He is standing over Paige's body. He's pointing his bat at everyone. The crowd's going nuts. And now it's time to go back up. So what Sting has to do, he has to hook one clip, and I stress that, one clip on his own harness. He has to hook one clip on the Paige's harness. And oh, by the way, he is also fighting off members of the NWO with a baseball bat at the same time. Oh, yeah. This was completely insane. Nuts. There was one point... Where it appeared the cable hanging from the ceiling was literally wrapped around his own neck, and he's still fighting to get free and fight guys off of the bat. And eventually, he is able to get them hooked up, and he gives the sign, and the cable pulls them up. And even watching this 19 years later and knowing everyone was fine here, this scared the bejesus out of me. Oh, yeah. So, that was Nitro. Don't ever do this cable stuff, everybody. It was just so crazy. I mean, God, it, it, every time he does it, he's got to yank on a thing, and he's got to wait for them to pull it up, and he's busy swinging his bat at guys. It's just crazy. It's madness. But that was Nitro. And what, and what did you get out of it? He, he got you nothing got out of it. It was, it was cool, and everybody popped. 
So, Nitro, also June 16th, 97, number 92. You never believe this, but the NWO arrived in a limo. Mm -hmm. It's becoming as repetitive as the boring 20-minute promo Open Raw. They're all happy. They're all smoking cigars. Dennis Rodman is with them, and they're in Chicago, so he's a huge star. The biggest star on the show, actually. I have a theory that Rodman actually procured these cigars because they've never smoked cigars and walked to the ring before. No, this is the first. This is the first. So everyone comes out, and then most of them leave. It's Hogan, Robin, and Bischoff in the spotlight. They're hyping up their match against Giant Lu and Luger at Bass of the Beach. Robin is a, I wouldn't say he's a great promo, but he's a natural promo. He's charismatic. He's got great delivery. He did refer to his opponent as Lex Luthor. Twice. Mm -hmm. Twice. Twice he called him Lex Luthor. They're uh, trying to, to, to make it a, uh, a pair of one-on-one -on -one matchups. Hogan versus Luger and Robin versus Giant. Oof. Yeah. And they ran their mouths for a while, and they bailed. And later, am I the only one who missed this? Apparently, they tried to back out of the match here. I missed that entirely until the announcers brought it up later. And I don't know if I was not paying attention or if they just cut a bad promo. I think they just cut a bad promo because okay. I don't want to make any accusations. But based on this and the end of the show, I would think that maybe they all went drinking before the show, mm. and then they drank during the show, mm. and then they kept drinking after the show. Okay. I will say that when the NWO arrived with Rodman in Chicago, they got a monstrous ovation. Mm -hmm. Sure. They took their sweet time going to the ring, place going absolutely apeshit. They came across as the biggest baby faces on the entire <laughs> planet. Now, granted, they're heels. That's beside the point. And I was watching this, and I just realized, you know, the Brett stuff is great. Team Canada, Shawn Michaels... Steve Austin. There's a lot of good stuff on Raw. But you know what? This show seems a thousand times cooler than Raw. This seems like if you were a fella and all your friends were watching wrestling, they'd all be watching this show and you would be watching this show with them because this seems like the cool show of the two. Then they got in the ring, Rodman fucked everything up, and it was like a WWE segment with Stephanie McMahon where it was hours upon hours of them just trying to get them over. Oh, yeah. In the Stupid Larry comment of the week, Zabisco referred to Dennis Rodman as Denise. He also said that uh, the p people in Chicago love him. Makes me embarrassed to be born in Chicago. Because everything has to be about Larry. Yeah. Glacier versus Mortis. This is a very 1990s match. This was actually one of the better matches I've ever seen Glacier in. This may have been you know? a 70s match. With all that God, karate afterwards. There was a lot of karate involved. God bless Chris Canyon, but he had the bright idea to, 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 to set up the stairs in such a way he would fall off the apron and crotch himself on the stairs, which could have hurt you very badly in a number of ways. And it wasn't the big spot at the end that turned the tide. It wasn't the finish. It was something they did 10 seconds in, and mm -hmm. 10, 10 seconds later, it's totally forgotten. Cool spot, though. <laughs> Look great. <laughs> Wrath comes out, climbs in the apron. Glacier throws Mortis into him, hits the crown at kick for the win. And then Wrath lays Glacier out. They're beating him up. They're beating him up, and uh, Sinister Minister standing in the ring, whatever his name was here. And Ernest Miller hits the ring from behind the Sinister Minister and leapfrogs him. Mm -hmm. That was awesome. And then he and Glacier clear the ring with karate kicks aplenty. And I can't deny it, Ernest Miller looked cool here. See, that's the key. This whole blood runs cold and the karate and everything like that. Eric Bischoff was such a karate mark yeah. that he probably thought this was just the most awesome thing ever. <laughs> and normally, I think it sucks, but I have to say, Ernest Miller had such cool kicks and Mortis took such awesome bumps for his cool kicks that this whole thing was pretty goddamn cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For once. Now, the funniest thing was they clear the ring, the baby faces do, only after the ring is cleared, security arrives to stand there and do nothing because the fight was over. Oakland interviews Medusa on the ramp. She had lost to Akira Hokuto of Great American Bash the night before and due to stipulations had to retire. And she was doing her best to work up tears. She's thanking her fans and her family and her supporters and her friends. Nearly collapsed on Gene's shoulder and says goodbye. And these fans just didn't care. I didn't either. And I, well, yeah. It's not as if she's been a big part of this show. Even in 97, the idea that people are retiring is ridiculous. But 
The problem is, she did a sad promo. Remember when they did the challenge for this match, and she wasn't sure she wanted to take it? Right. And she had to act. Yeah. Very concerned. Mm-hmm. God bless Medusa. Lovely woman, even today. A horrible actress. Yeah. The performance here, where she had to retire, was so horrible that everybody is booing, and they're angry, and Gene Okerlund has to tell the people to please shut up. We're having a touching moment here. Mm-hmm. Nobody bought it. Now, does she come under come back under a hood or something? No, I, I looked I this remember. up. I looked this up. This was, in fact, her last appearance on Nitro for two years. Wow. Yeah. There I don't know go. if it was supposed to be a retirement or if she just... She was going to become a valet. Yeah. Not a truck driver? Well, she eventually became a truck driver. Okay, on the road. Dean Malenko came out for a promo. He called out Eddie Guerrero. Dared him to face him like a man. But to Eddie... be fair, he called out Guerrero. I see. Well, I guess he got his answer then, because yeah, Chavo right. Guerrero Jr. came out. So... Chavo was very, very green at this point. He was fucking stuff up left and right. And the big finish is Dean hits the hit a neutralizer like Cesaro does. He goes to hook the clover leaf when Eddie finally appears and he comes on a stage and stops. So Dean says, All right. And he puts Chavito in the clover leaf and Chavito taps, and that's that. Favorite part of this match, there's both of them are standing Eddie staring at each other. They both take a step forward and both of them at the same time duck. Yeah. That happened twice on this show. Right, because it also happened in the Jericho Dragon match. Yes. That match was much worse. Yes. This was a, a decent match. Malenko did a good job with the guy. That's about all I got to say about that. They plugged the website and said, if you go to WCWWrestling.com, you get an exclusive interview with Ric Flair. They did not call it a podcast, because no one knew what a podcast was, but that's what this was. It was a podcast. Mm-hmm. Super Colo versus Laparca. What does it matter with Super Kolo diving into the audience on small children? You know, Sabu's nickname is the homicidal, suicidal, genocidal guy. Wrong person. Yo, yeah. Kolo is the most homicidal, suicidal wrestler of all time. But this is this. Okay. He just came back from breaking his arm. Mm-hmm. First match back. He does the tumbleweed from the inside of the ring to the outside onto the floor, mm-hmm. which he did in this match. Mm-hmm. And then he does that crazy flip dive. That takes him about three rows deep in the crowd. Yeah. But this time, there's a small child in the front row. Well, when you buy your ticket, Craig. When I buy my ticket, that's fine. I'll catch Super Kolo. You know who I don't expect to catch Super Kolo? My son. Actually, I've seen your son. He probably could catch Super Kolo. That's probably true. It's <laughs> actually valid. Let's talk about this the other... This boy did not. Listen, all these things, the child was not hurt, nor was Super Kolo hurt on anything. Until the end, when he was hurt by the other guy. That's true. Well, yeah, there's more. So they do they do a loot, there's they do a match. There's two guys doing a bunch of flips, and uh, Kolo hits a Rana and wins. Right. So as soon as the ref counts three, Parker jumps up. He lays Kolo out, running the entire match null and void. And then something dumb happens. Mm-hmm. And the Parker goes under the ring, pulls out a chair. It's a plastic chair, like you sat in at school. It's a one piece plastic chair, a hard plastic chair. Mm-hmm. And he picks it up and swings it like a mofo and breaks it over Super Kolo's head. Don't do this. You know, broke the chair. Yes. Send the guy to the hospital, knocked out. And according to the Observer, they've wrote that Laparca felt worse because of the guilt. And I thought, no, you know, <laughs> maybe he felt I, I don't want to say he didn't feel bad, but. What the fuck was he thinking was going to happen? What did you, if you swing a hard object at somebody and it breaks? This was not like an accident. No. Where, like, Joey Mercury, when his face got destroyed, that was an accident. Accidents happen in wrestling all the time. Accidents happen and you feel bad. But when you grab a chair mm-hmm. and you swing it as hard as you possibly can and you hit the guy square in the head, the chair breaks, and he's down and out, <laughs> what were you expecting? Caught up in the moment, I guess. I What were you expecting? He raised the chair high above his head and brought it crashing down, and it broke the seat of the chair on his head. Yeah, everything went according to plan here. So what this was for about six minutes of ultraviolence, of bodies flying in the stands and landing on the mat and chairs broken over heads, and at the end of the day, nobody got over. <laughs> this accomplished nothing. He had... Giant and Luger coming out for a promo. It was Lex's hometown of Chicago, but they still preferred Robin in the NWO. 
Here was where I was clued in that the NWO had been trying to get out of that tag match earlier. It was news to me. Lex insists they had a valid contract. Reminds everyone last week he made Hogan submit. He was being sarcastic and saying, oh, the NWO is so tough and so bad, we should back up now. And Giant roars that he's got the guts and the goods and the choke slam. He dares them to come and get it. And Lex translated this as a challenge to the NWO for a match tonight. You go to break. And they announced the NWO has accepted the challenge, which means, yes, Dennis Rodman at the time was one of the biggest stars in American sports. He was going to make his in-ring debut for free with barely an hour's build. Sure. Mm-hmm. Well, you don't pay it off. I guess not. So Luger had to cover for those jokers doing a bad job cutting a promo in the first few minutes of the show. Mm-hmm. You ever worked with somebody who was drunk? Why are you looking at me? I don't Why know. are you looking at us? <laughs> well, I know you haven't because you don't work well with others. What are you talking about? We do a Christmas show every year. Do you mean wrestling working or working working? No, no, working working. I've never worked with someone who was drunk. It sucks because they're your work coworkers and your buddies most of the time. So you kind of have to pick up their slack and cover for them. That's how I felt Lex Luger was right here. I feel like that on a daily basis. See, I, <laughs> if, if you showed up to work drunk and you ruined my day, I let people know about it. I will not cover your ass for nothing. Hmm. Bitches get stitches. <laughs> Amazing French Canadians versus Harlem Heat. There's a tag match. Stevie gets the hot tag. Stevie Ray makes his comeback. Man, you're underselling this one. It's not very good. Stevie Ray's comeback was a thing of beauty. It was much better than Mosh's. What a (laughs) house of fire he was. They hit the heat bomb. Heat bomb. (laughs) Parker takes... Every move in the 90s was your name, followed by bomb, lock, or drop. That's right. The Vinny bomb. I remember that one. That's (laughs) right. So they hit the heat bomb, and Colonel Parker takes the referee. Rougeau hits Booker with a boot to the back of his head. Then they hit their finish. No, I'm sorry. He hits him with the thing, and Booker kicks out. Yeah. And then Harlem Heat hits their finish and gets to win. Yeah, which is not the heat bomb. Why in the hell did they do any of this stuff with Rob Parker if it led to nothing? Because they had to book 75 different angles in a three-minute match. This sucked. <laughs> yes. <laughs> then, J.J. Dillon... Harlem Heat, Gene Okerlund, and Sister Sherry were all on the ramp talking about at least three different things at once, I think. Okay, what I what I what I think happened the night before was there was a Harlem Heat versus Steiner's match. Correct. And Vincent interfered, and so Harlem Heat won via DQ. Right. Okay. Okay. First of all, Dylan has to make the NWO match with Robin for tonight official. They start talking about this top contenders match and how there was interference and a DQ. Everyone's shouting at each other. Dylan Book, Steiner's Heat, rematch for next week. Guarantees there will be a legitimate winner. I paused to let you get more details in, but you didn't get any in. So he claims (laughs) Harlem Heat won via DQ in this number one contenders match. He says, J.J. Dylan says, the NWO is attempting to manipulate the rankings in order to get easier opponents. Right? Yeah. Brian's logging back on his And I just thought, thank you, I was hoping that people would see that as a dramatic pause and not me playing with the computer. So I just thought, you know... Type your password in. Why is JJ taking this out on Harlem Heat? He's flat out accusing them of being in cahoots with... The NWO. The NWO. Sure. With no, like, there's zero evidence of this. Mm-hmm. So he he signs them to a rematch next week, and all I could think as a fan was, Harlem Heat got fucked. <laughs> it's not their fault this idiot ran in. They won via DQ. They That's promised, what he said. They promised the winner would get the title. Match. That's right. It felt like JJ was screwing these two guys. Hmm. So Vincent comes out. Oh, there's more? Oh, no, Vincent. Vincent. <laughs> this Vincent, his promo. <laughs> That was worth my nine ninety nine this month for the network. <laughs> you know the, how much money this guy made during his career? More than minimum wage. Not enough to keep him out of the subway selling pictures for five bucks. My God. His promo was so bad. I can't believe they let him talk. And when Harlem Heat beat the shit out of him afterwards, <laughs> I was just cackling and howling. The funny part is when they ripped off his shirt and it 
was obvious that he wore a shirt all the time in WCW. Just flabby and hairy and... Why not? <sighs> I mean, aside from his own self-respect, what was the point? <laughs> <laughs> What's the point of being in shape? Because when I think of self-respect and dignity, the first thing that pops to my mind is Virgil. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> point of Macon is... With the job he had, the only reason to stay in shape is your own self-respect. <laughs> yeah, sure. no. Because it's not for your fucking career. Yes. So this segment was a mess. We had God, a- his promo. I wish I had it in front of me to play it. <laughs> you can load it up. It won't take that long. I don't care that much. Rey Mysterio Jr. versus Six for the Cruiserweight title. Outsiders are out there being big and scary. So you've all seen X-Pac do the Bronco Buster, right? Mm-hmm. He sits the guy down in the corner and flies at him and lands crotch first in his face. I'm sure it's no fun. But he takes Ray here and turns Ray face down so his belly is on the mat and his head's leaning up against the turnbuckle and then does the Bronco Buster. Don't ever do that again. Oh, look oh my like God. it sucked. Good Lord. But you know what? It's X-Pot. So I have, I have full faith that Ray was not injured at all. I, yes. But if he had been, the injury would have been severe. The risk to reward ratio is way out of whack for this one. So Ray makes his comeback, does a flip dive from the top rope to the floor, hits the diving Ron in the ring, goes to make the cover. Outsiders try to hit the ring for the DQ, but itty bitty little Ray Mysterio is the best hummingbird you ever saw flying around taking these giants out. And Nash takes a big giant bump over the top rope, and the place is going crazy. The place is popping more for this than any match they have all night. And then Six grabs him and puts him in the buzz killer and taps him out, and Six wins. You know, the X-Pac heat term that everybody used for a decade before they decided they liked the guy. You know what X-Pac was? You know why he was hated? Because he was Bobby Fulton. But he was a star. He was a guy that was a small, skinny guy. And unlike all of the other small, skinny guys in WCW that did lucha and high-flying and all of this craziness... He was just a great worker. Yeah. And I think it made people angry that he was the guy that would beat the guys like Rey Mysterio. And he wasn't a Super Colo or a La Parca or a Ray Jr. or a Hoovy or a high-flying, exciting guy. He was just a good, solid worker. And that pissed people off. That's the only thing that I can think of about why he was so hated. By the way, let's not gloss over the fact that the Outsiders piled into the ring. Oh, there's more, yeah. Laid waste to Ray. You've got that. Well, go ahead. And Nash ended oh. the beating with the sickest and ugliest power bomb I have ever seen to Ray Mysterio. I wrote careless. Yeah. Careless. Sloppy. Absolutely. Yeah. Craig, uh, you have I a used. child. Vinny does not have a child. Right. I wrote very dangerous power bomb. What's funny is Nash, I think, had a child at this point. I think its baby was born in like 96 or something like that. I, Google it for me. Tristan Nash. Find out how old he is. This isn't creepy at all. Why is it creepy? He's like, he's, there's a point in, in all of this. You know, there's a bearded man I'm looking at. Yeah, how old is he? When was he born? Uh, it's got the news on their unfortunate uh, brawl they had. Oh, yeah, they had that that's, incident. That's terrible news. Powerbombing them. Uh, he was 18 in 2014, so he would have been three or four at the time of this Nitro then. Okay, so as someone who well, has one. a baby. No, one, I'm sorry, he would have been one. One, okay, yeah. so he had a, a very small baby. Mm-hmm. What do you do with a very small baby? You're, you're ultra- careful with them. You gotta make sure their head doesn't Yeah, you don't let their head wobble too much. You take care of them. You hold them. I'm not saying that Rey Mysterio was a baby, but I'm saying that when you're 6'10", Oh, yeah. And the other guy is 5'2 and 150 pounds. You're significantly larger than another human being. You do everything you can as a giant man not to break that small human being. Yeah, take care of the guy. He lifted him up, and he just threw him right on his head and shoulder. Uh-huh. Like, he didn't give a shit. Yeah. He just about killed the guy. It looked like a deliberate attempt to end the guy's career. God. Is so it that the- hard to just lift him up and put him down on his back? He's 150 fucking pounds. It's not like the giant when he dropped him on his head. Yeah. That, that, That's at least, this, the guy was, was too heavy, and you thought you were too strong, and you weren't. No. Nash is such a lazy worker. He got him, like, halfway up and then just let go of him. Just, um, ugh. Yeah. So they cut a promo, and they're celebrating the win over Piper and Flair the night before. They bring out Savage. Savage brags about his win over Dallas Page. Page appears in the crowd. They were in the uh, United Center in Chicago, which I didn't realize was such a big building. Huge. He was way, way, way up there. He says, Savage, you needed Hogan's help to take me out twice. Now you're teaming up with Hall. Nobody knows Scott Hall better than I do. 
I found myself a partner. Everyone knows who he is, and I challenge you and Scott Hall to a tag team match. I, th- I think the NWO accepted. It was sad because I could barely see Kimberly. <laughs> Chris Jericho versus Ultimo Dragon. Sonny Ono came out, offered Jericho an envelope full of cash in exchange for a selfie. Jericho pushed him away. Which another thing about it would be a great spot for his new gimmick. Mm. Someone should approach Jericho in the hallway for a selfie. He should push them away, call him a stupid idiot, and go to the ring. And take the cash. And take the cash. <laughs> so they they opened this match with a big, complicated, Osprey Ricochet-style spot. And it's going fine. And then both guys ducked at the same time. And they bonked into each other. And the neither Matador knew who should go down. spot. Yeah. So Jericho goes to the suplex and grabs a hold. There's boring chance for Chris Jericho and Ultimo Dragon. They come back for some big moves. There's a superplex. There's a double powerbomb. There's more boring chance, and Dragon hits a tiger suplex for the win. <laughs> That's fair. I think they got their time cut, and it's funny because Jericho just, as soon as shit started going wrong, he panicked. Mm-hmm. And he started doing all these moves he's never done before, this leg drop. He randomly did a leg drop, and they did this drop kick off the top, which essentially he jumped off the post and landed on his feet and brushed Dragon, who took this flying bump. This was a mess. Lee Marshall made a weasel joke in the road report. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Gene brings out Roddy Piper for a promo. <laughs> now, here is what I was able to piece together by the end of this, what had happened the night before. Apparently, Roddy was in the NWO locker room at this point. <laughs> that that would explain a lot. It had The match had been Roddy and Flair versus Hall and Nash. And, of course, wherever Hall and Nash went those days, six followed. So, during the match, six and Flair had brawled to the back. And Rick was never seen again, and so uh, Piper was left alone, and the Outsiders beat him. All right? So Gene brings Piper out here, and he says, Flair disappeared during the match with you the night before. Where did he go? And Roddy says, all I know is I've heard the rumors about Flair leaving me high and dry. Flair is my friend. He would never do that. I got to the back, and Flair was gone. And his bag was gone. And the other horsemen were gone. I'm sure there's a perfectly fine explanation for all this. Drinking. So he calls out Flair. And Flair says, Roddy, I would never abandon you. And Roddy says, cool. And they're friends again. Roddy came off like the biggest moron in the segment. All I know is that they said this misunderstanding has been cleared up. And all I could think was, Piper's turning on the guy. I just figured it was a swerve. Piper's turning? Yeah. All right. Piper's going to turn on Flair. That's why he was so... That's what I think. I actually don't know. I forget where it goes, but that would explain why Piper was such an idiot and made up with him, and he's going to get him. He's going to stab him in the back. This does not explain why Flair left the arena mid-match. It doesn't. (laughs) It's WCW. Okay. Don't think about it too much. You've got me there. Curvy Blonde was making eyes with him from the uh, third row. Hmm. Or Burnett. <laughs> He's never been the pickiest no. guy. Vicious and Delicious versus Jeff Jarrett and Steve McMichael. <laughs> they didn't mention like halfway through this match that it was in Chicago and Steve McMichael's in the ring. So the first two minutes of this were great because Scott Norton's a giant man and he had no fear of Mongo. Mm-mm. And he is stiffing this guy left and right, just beating the Ukfi out of him, <laughs> screaming, this isn't the NFL. But then here's the thing. Mongo's a tough bastard, too. Right. So he just, when it's his turn, he just flips the switch, and he's throwing palms, and Norton's bumping all over the place. This is great. That's why I love wrestling. Even in MMA, if you have two heavyweights, sometimes they get tired. Sometimes it's boring. Pro wrestling, you get two giant dudes, and they just pound on each other. It's fucking great. Oh, yeah. I loved Norton and Mongo together. I, I, I am just in love with Mongo lately. <laughs> it's been great. I remember in the 90s, it was like, Mongo's a horseman. Jesus, this guy. But mm-hmm. man, he was wondrous. So eventually, they cut off Jarrett. And they're beating him up for a while. And he will make his own comeback and not tag out. And they cut him off again. And finally, Bagwell slaps Mongo. Mongo comes in without a tag. He helps Jarrett hit a double backdrop. And Jarrett says, hey, Mongo, partner, let's do a strut together. He begins to strut, and Mongo says, fuck you. And he spins him around and leaves him out with a tombstone and drops him. 
So he looks in the camera and says, this is payback for Jarrett hitting me in the back last night. Mongo leaves. Deborah, for the first time, leaves with him. Mm-hmm. Jared is dead. Bagwell pins him. It's all fine and dandy, but please, 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 please tell me that Jared will never be considered a horseman again. I can't take the dysfunctional horseman <laughs> again. I can't go back to it. It's dead and gone now. I love this segment because A, A, we had Mongo versus Vicious. Yes. I presume he's vicious and not delicious. <laughs> as best I can tell. Okay. And I also loved that Mongo is mad at the guy because he hit him. And he made it very clear, I honestly don't care if you hit me on purpose or not, but you hit me, and so you deserve this beating. And he deliberately waited until the end of the match to beat the guy's ass. Because he's Mongo. He didn't mind having a fight first. Yeah. They were going to have a fight, and when everything was going their way, he was going to kill the guy. Yes. And he did, and he explained why. It was great. Heck of a tombstone, too. I don't think I would have trusted Mongo with that move. Now, I can't believe they gave him that move. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of nuts. But he's a strong guy. Yeah. Hogan and Robin came out to face Luger and the Giant. As my notes here read, first, Hogan and Robin came out for a promo. I have no idea what they said. It was a catchphrase verse. They went to break. And they came back. Hogan and Robin are still talking. They say, fuck it, and they left. Out come Luger and the Giant. They chase him back to the ring. So everyone's in the ring. There's this big stare-down moment. And then Hogan and Robin go to throw punches. They are both blocked. Giant grabs Robin by the neck, lifts him into the air, kind of like for a chokeslam. Hogan makes a save on that, so Giant goes after Hogan. But Rodman drops the giant with a belt shot for seriously the biggest pop on the entire show. And then the Outsiders and Six and Savage come out and they destroy Giant and Luger and they spray paint him and that is how it ended. Man, the amount of garbage Thank you. that was thrown oh, yeah. into the ring Thank during you. this. It was a blizzard. One of the biggest blizzards of garbage ever. It was like they raged, uh, They lit up a sign that said, please pelt the ring with garbage. It was weird about it because like when Hogan and Rodman came out at the beginning of the show, they were gods. Yeah. And then at the end of the show, they beat up these two geeks, and then everyone pelts the ring with garbage. It's because most fans, they see that on TV, and then it's like, okay, this is That's our the cue. Gimmick. This is our cue to start throwing stuff at the ring. All I know is Rodman was doing his hilarious elbow drops, oh. which is, I'm going to run at you, and I'm just going to fall on you with my back repeatedly. Yeah. yeah. Granted, he doesn't have much weight, and he was falling under the giant. But I was laughing. Y- yes. Rodman was a huge man, dude. It, well, he was a big man. He was a large person. He probably weighed like less 220. than 200. 220? About that. Six, he was, he was six, six, seven. Yeah. But it's a lot easier to teach a 200-pound guy to drop an elbow on a 500-pound guy than vice versa. Fair, That's for fair sure. Fair enough. Yeah. And then they all stood there celebrating like seven guys at a bar at 4 a.m. after last call. <laughs> <laughs> 2 a.m. Exactly what they look like. Chicago bars. Yeah, and I just watched Hall there, and it's like, he didn't do jack shit on the show except drink, it looked like. It's possible. And made his $15,000. What a life. Could that was worse. the show, everybody. That was the show. We are at war! Uh, so, <laughs> Nitro 93, also June 23rd, 1997. Now, I will, not, I will not go back and say this show was not boring, because I'm sure it was. Oh, yeah. I suspect you're right. Gene opens the show by bringing out DDP and Kimberly for a promo. Her stomach. Her everything. She's a lovely woman. He wants to know who Paige's surprise partner is going to be against Randy Savage and Scott Hall. Paige says he loves surprises, how much he enjoys Christmas and birthdays because he has open presents. And he wants to keep his partner a secret until Bash at the Beach. And Kimberly says she hates surprises. So I thought her next line was going to be, I'm going to withhold sex until Paige tells me who his partner is. But no, her next line was, I called J.J. Dillon and booked a match between Paige and Scott Hall. All right. Mm-hmm. Wasn't a very good promo, but <laughs> I would do what she says. Sure. Just saying. Man. Yeah. Hey, I, there's no nothing wrong with putting Kimberly on TV. What's the opposite of a dream match? I know I asked that a lot reviewing Nitro. What are you talking about? Public Enemy and Damien <laughs> Public Leparka Enemy versus do not and denigrate Damien. this match. <sighs> Why not? <laughs> it was, I mean, it was bad, but it, it was wasn't. terrible. <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> well, okay, I'll give you that. It may have been Johnny so bad. Johnny Grunge's absolutely hideously hilarious comeback. 
I or at one see. point, I believe he just pushed Laparka and uh-huh. then turned around and just kept doing other stuff. <laughs> yes. yes. He's like, I'll touch you and you just go flying because he I'm shoved, tired. He shoved him. This was for... He, Sometimes it'll be two men on two different pages. This was four men, so you think four different pages. There were at least nine different pages in this match. Hey, at least these guys knew enough to get a table that would break. They got a table that would break, or as Hamo would, Hamo would shout, it's pre-cut. So It wasn't pre-cut. It was just not a shit table. Yeah. So they put Damien through a table, and then Parker hit Grunz with a chair and pinned him, and then I wrote, let's just never speak of this again. <laughs> you know, let me explain something to all the listeners out there. Maybe there were companies that pre-cut their tables, but you don't want to pre-cut a table. No. What you want is a table. If you imagine a a table that you see on Raw all the time, which is just your normal, what kind of wood is it, Craig? Just plywood. Plywood, particle board, whatever, with the legs on it. Don't pre-cut it. You want it to be able to hold a man, but when another man goes through it, it breaks, and that breaks your fall. It's a cushion. You don't want a pre-cut table where you're going to go through it like butter because that fucking hurts. You land on the floor. Number one. Mm -hmm. And you don't want a table that's so goddamn hard that you got to jump three times to break the leg. Yeah. Just do a normal table. I noticed in WCW, they took off the metal that goes underneath those tables. Bad idea. They 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 would break easier. Yeah, but you go through that like butter. Yeah, then you land on the floor. These are heavy men here. It's like... I did one hardcore match with, with Tim and... uh Maybe it, it it didn't surprise me, but people don't seem to realize that we're falling off the top rope to the floor. It's much better to have a table between you and said floor. Uh, yeah, Absolutely. at least one, maybe two. A uh, dude, it's much better to have it between you and anything you're falling on. Yes. Although I do remember when I was very young and dumb, and we were doing shows at the gymnastics facility. <laughs> I had this great idea. Shows, he says. Yeah. I was Savio Vega. These were shows. Dude, I had King 5 News covering these shows. Oh. So we, I had this great idea, which was, we had these, the, they're called spotting blocks, probably four or five feet high, and I was going to stack a few of them up so we were like 10 feet in the air, and I was going to have Chris Kelly powerbomb me, and my idea was, in order to not die, because I'm falling from a very great height, I'm going to stack up three plywood boards so that each one successively will break more of my fall as I go down to the ground. I thought I'm so brilliant. Now, the good news is, it really broke my fall. Mm-hmm. Probably on the first one. The bad news was, when I went through the first one, and then I started going through the second one, the remains of the first one <laughs> fell on me. And then I went through the second one, and the remains of the first and the second one fell on me. And then I went through the third one, and the remains of all three fell on me. It was like a fucking Wiley e. Coyote cartoon where he falls off the cliff, and then the boulder falls on top of him. I'm honestly legit flabbergasted you went through all three. Oh, oh did I you did. you 120 pounds Dude, then? They were like they were like, I don't know, half inch thick. They mm. were very, very thin. I see. But I learned a valuable lesson. That's why you don't go through multiple fucking tables. You just find one goddamn table to go through. There's no way they were half inch thick. An inch thick. I don't know what they were. There's Whatever no way they they're were. an inch thick. <laughs> what were they? They're probably eighth. Eighth inch. Yeah, whatever. Eighths. Whatever. I These went are- through them like butter. <laughs> And then the butter fell on you. <laughs> and then that fucking butter fell on me. <laughs> Sharp, pointy I butter. I was like popcorn. Eddie Guerrero joined Gene for a promo. Eddie insisted he was a stand-up kind of a guy who would never force his nephew into a match he didn't want. Then he said he was still not medically cleared, and Chavo had offered to take that match, and Eddie had stepped aside. This would mean that WCW booked Eddie for a match even though he was not medically cleared. Chavo came out and said he didn't really offer to take the match, but before he could say anything else, Eddie cut off and said, look, let's not worry about the past. I've got a match with six tonight, but I'll step aside and you can get a title shot. Chavo was not sure what to make of this, but at the end of the day, he was not turning down a free championship match. Alex Wright versus Chris Jericho. Better than last time. Much better than last time. How did Alex Wright get a job? I know he's a good looking kid. Dad was a wrestler. Okay. Good looking kid. He Tall. Was, he was pretty. And showed up on time. Dude, they had like two hundred they had like more than two hundred. They had like two hundred and fifty people in a contract at one point. And Alex Wright's the one that you just can't handle. We just watched Public Enemy. <laughs> we just watched Johnny Grunge. <laughs> your point is make a comeback on Luchadors. Your point is valid. <laughs> God. I wanted to never speak of that again. <laughs> let me let me give uh Larry some credit here. Larry of course, has to bury everybody and put himself over. 
But Larry did say, these guys are moving way too fast. Yes, mm-hmm. and I the, saw that too. For the first time in his life, he was absolutely correct. They were moving way too damn fast, and they should have listened to him. Would have been a better match. Chris Jericho in 97 was wrestling like Dolph Ziggler in 2016. Going too damn fast. Remember that time we saw Larry at the uh, barbecue joint in Florida? Mm-hmm. Just st- stood there and looked at him. Go back in the archives and listen to when I interviewed Larry. That's yeah. the more impressive. Thing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yes, Jericho was going too th- uh, going too fast. He also hit a. He calls that the lion salt, according to Mike Tanay. So to it's, a standing opponent. So it's his fault. Yeah. And Jericho won with the Boston Crab, a vast improvement over the last match, and because Jericho got offense. Here was where they tried to show. This is the worst of it. And they tried to show Vincent interfering in the tag match of the pay per view, and I I couldn't see it. There was I spent like a good five minutes trying to get the show running again. Steiners versus Harlem Heat. I hope you saw this match. This was something. This was <laughs> what this was was every tag match you ever saw, except about once a minute, one of the Steiners would do something amazing. To me, it was a match where sometimes it was great, and sometimes it was sloppy. There's it, a lot of sloppiness. It really depended on who was throwing around who and when. Yes. The best part of this match, which every single young wrestler on earth should watch this match so that they can see Rick Steiner and Booker T doing a vertical suplex spot. You have never seen two men get more out of a vertical suplex. So great. So eventually... Sherry climbs in the apron. Rick throws Booker into her, knocks her to the floor, and then he hit Booker with the top rope bulldog for the win. Top rope bulldog looked bad because Rick basically kneed him in the head <laughs> as he was coming off the ropes. It, man, that looked bad. And, uh, yeah, he made the cover, and the ref's counting three, and Steve Ray's blocking the camera, so we couldn't see really what's going on. But at one point, the ref just stopped counting, and everyone looked at each other, and the bell rang. So I assume he was down for a three count. Vicious and Delicious joined Gene for a promo. Said the Steiners cannot possibly be top contenders for the tag titles because Scott Steiner's arms were too skinny. Hmm. And Buff flexed. You know. Buff was funny. Buff has definitely had his moments, man. And they called the Steiners out, but then when the Steiners came to answer, they ran away because they're great heels. Steiners then completely blew them off. I don't know exactly what they said. There was more buffering. They called out Holland Nash. Had a video of Ernest Miller doing karate. <laughs> this that is karate fella. I didn't write his name down. He's putting over Ernest, and he says this Ernest Miller is his quickness is unparalleled for a man his size. Especially, he says, considering how karate has advanced here in the nineties. Yes. <laughs> and I'm like, give me a break, dude. We've all seen UFC. You're trying very, very hard here to put over karate. Mm-hmm. Now I will say. All they showed Ernest doing was working some heavy bags and doing some very, very light sparring, but he did look like a badass. Well, hey, I'll tell you this. Jumping forward a little bit, but this match with Ernest Miller, this was Ernest Miller's first ever professional wrestling match. He looked great then. He looked great. He worked the ropes great. He was a point karate guy, Mm -hmm. which is where you're not doing full contact karate. You got to pull all your kicks and everything like that. So obviously he threw great kicks and never touched anybody. Mm. Worked the ropes great. Very, very athletic. He was called the cat for a reason. But the problem was, from this point forward, he never learned how to work. Pretty much. <laughs> he started at a certain level and stayed at that level for his entire career. If he would have actually applied himself, if he would have liked wrestling, he could have been really fucking good. I guess he taught Eric Bischoff's kid karate. Mm-hmm. Ah, uh, so there Eric it is. was like, you want to be a pro wrestler and make hundreds of thousands of dollars? Yes. And do virtually no work? Yes. And Ernest said, I, I-, I do. Yes, yes, I do. Viano 4 versus Hector Garza. They just pull names out of a hat. <laughs> grab, grab any two Mexican men backstage. Yeah, Hector match. Garza. Dude, Hector Garza and Viano 4 is a lot less weird than the public enemy versus La Parca and Damien. I told you I don't want to speak of it anymore, but this you're right. This match was just about as good. It's just a bunch of moves. This was just boring. The other one was sloppy and, 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 and hysterical, but th- this was just really, really boring. I did laugh... Garz did like a backflip, landed on his backflip with ropes, landed on his feet, and into another backflip, and then Viano just clotheslined him to death. That was funny. 
What was notable about this match was the announcers just bickered the whole time. Because mm-hmm. they were First, bored too. Well, Larry goes, is this a Mexican rules match? <laughs> and Tanay goes, what, are you worried about tags? Uh-huh. It's a singles match. And Larry goes, I know it's a singles match, but is it Mexican rules? So they're bickering back and forth. And now Larry's mad that he's been questioned. He's confused. And so at the end of the match, Hector Garza does a body slam. And he turns around, and he's facing a corner. And Tony Schiavone says, he's going back up top. <laughs> and instead, Garza does a standing moonsault. And Larry goes, oh, he went back up on top, Tony. And then, as they do the replay, he's burying Tony the entire time for being wrong about this guy going back up top. i <laughs> like, fuck off all of you. <laughs> this ain't even a funny bit. It's just shit. This is a boring match that nobody cared about. Lex Luger and Giant came out for a promo, trying to be very serious about being humiliated and spray painted last week. They're going to use that to fuel their revenge. That's boring. Giant said, I'm going to put a hook in the worm. <laughs> that was a funny line, actually. And they talked some more, and it did, in fact, go too long, and it was boring. Listen, I'm not Craig. I'm not constantly noticing everybody's fashion on this show, but... yes. Luger with his sleeveless checkered shirt tucked into his tight jeans with a belt. What the fuck was this? He looked like an idiot. Fresh off the farm. May as well have been wearing an elephant in the ring. I have a cousin who lives in Atlanta. And many years ago, he was working at a shoe store when Lex Luger and his kids came in. Hmm. And from what he's described, this is how Lex dresses, or at least how he did 20 years ago. Gold chains, sleeveless shirt tucked into jeans, and big heavy combat boots. Chavo Guerrero Jr. versus Six. Very simple story. Chavito was the clear underdog, so Six took 80% of the match. He's giving him some hope spots and near falls at the end when Eddie came out to watch, but just stood on the ramp and scowled. So Chavo hits a dive to the floor and gets back in the ring. As the ref is counting Six out, Hall hits the ring, lays Chavo out with the outsider's edge. Eddie is just still scowling from the stage, and then Six puts Chavo in the chicken wing for the win. Eddie was very disappointed. It's fine. Yeah, it really it was, was. It was good. Six, when he does those leg drops that he's just moving, you can hardly even see what he's actually doing. Mm-hmm. Kind of annoys me. <laughs> <laughs> Six is awesome. Don't get me wrong. I mean, he's... I just I don't know why that was so funny. <laughs> I guess I did not where I thought you were going with that. Super, super fast leg drops. It just doesn't mean... How? Okay. <laughs> it just doesn't mean anything. It just... I don't know. It's just a series of leg drops. It's nonsense, Vinny. Nonsense. I guess we were just yelling at Chris Jericho for going too fast. This Michinoku driver looked really cool. Six, if you're listening, slow down the leg drops. Yeah, quit doing those shitty leg drops. Yeah, it makes Craig mad. Break your butt again. That's why I had X-Pac heat. That must be it. The leg drops. Yes, that's it. All right. I'm trying to get through these next two segments without getting angry. <clears throat> Good luck. Steve and Michael versus Conan. Again, last week. Again, two names and a hat. <laughs> last week... Mongo turned on his tag team partner, Jeff Jarrett, gave me tombstone pile driver, dropping him on his head and compressing his spine in the middle of the ring. Mm -hmm. One would think Jeff Jarrett would now be out of the horseman. I would. One would be wrong. They explained that Jeff Jarrett is on, quote, horseman probation. Mm. Double secret probation. So that feud just won't die. Speaking of feuds going absolutely nowhere, Hugh Morris came with a broom. He distracted Conan. Mongo won with a tombstone. I still can't believe they gave him that finisher. Hey, he hasn't hurt anybody Sh- yet. Yeah. Yet. This was not horrible. I cannot say that it was any good. <laughs> they may have taught him how to do tackles and the one tombstone and just left it at that. Just make sure you can do fuck that. more does Mongo need? It's true. Um, you want me doing technical wrestling? No. Please, no. And a Chris Benoit highlight video to hype up his match with Kevin Sullivan. Gene brings out Roddy Piper for a pro- promo. This. <sighs> you know, this was one of those interviews where I think that Roddy thought that he was being so clever. But in reality, he was a raving lunatic. Mm-hmm. And I didn't understand a goddamn word he said. They have the Wellbeth program in WCW at this time. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Do you watch this show? <laughs> I apologize. 
So Gene brings this man out for a promo, promo, and his first question, and I should have written it down word for word, but in essence, he asked, are you and Ric Flair still friends? Are these seventh grade girls? Are you still friends? Pass him a note. Check the box. Yes or no. (laughs) So Piper dodges the question, spends about five minutes talking about what a bad guy he himself was. And finally, he said, yes, we're still friends, but Flair dates two women, so they'll have something to talk to after he falls asleep. That's a great line. (laughs) This brings out Flair all pissed off. (laughs) Flair is talking about he's fighting the NWO while Piper is out, quote, floating around the Caribbean with Jenny McCarthy. What? What the fuck? (laughs) (laughs) Roddy didn't deny it. No. Because these old guys, they're all about, we're going to put each other over, brother. One way or the other. So they're mad at each other. Outcome, Mongo, Mongo, Deborah, and Benoit. And there's it's these three people, Piper and Flair. Piper says, this is between me and Flair. And Gene decides, as, as this is going on, hey, Deborah, what's up with Jeff Jarrett? Well, what'd she say? Uh, she dumped him. I don't even know. She said she discarded him like yesterday's laundry. Yeah. So Flair and Piper both wanted to leave and let this go, but Mongo wouldn't let it go. He's putting his finger in Piper's chest and making fun of his skirt. Flair is trying to make peace. Trying to get Piper out of there so you can still be friends with everyone and they can still all go drinking together. Fans are chanting Roddy's name. Mongo warns Flair that Piper will stab him in the back. Benoit begins to make fun of Piper's spine. The whole time, Flair is begging Mongo and Benoit to just shut up. Finally, Piper can take no more. He decks Benoit. He decks Mongo. The only good thing in this entire segment. Upon seeing the horseman get punched... Ric Flair throws a tremendous tantrum. He's stomping. He's screaming. He's jumping up and down like a small child. He bounces up the ropes. And then at the end of the day, damn it, he's a horseman. He throws a punch at Roddy. Roddy blocks. He briefly comes back. Eventually, he is briefcased and triple teamed. At least there was a payoff to all this. What I got out of this was they let Mongo hit him with a Halliburton and and they let Mongo stomp on him as Benoit had him in the crossface. Mm-hmm. Wow. A lot, they had a lot of faith in this Mongo guy. I like the fact that Rick didn't want to hit him, but Piper struck first on his boys. And so he had to hit him. Yes. It was great. Because at the end of the day, he's a horseman first. Right. As we all are. We wish. Glacier and Ernest Miller versus High Voltage. You are right in that Ernest Miller are totally fine here. You're not mentioned it went like 90 seconds. You know who didn't look fine? This rage. Or was it chaos? <laughs> His rage. It I, I, I have no idea how I know the difference. It's Blake. I, you no, know, <laughs> I can't tell Blake and Murphy apart. I think I can, maybe. But like Blake and Murphy and the revival. The Naturals. For some reason, I have a way easier time Hot shots. knowing the difference between rage and chaos. I don't even know why. But anyway, rage did the funniest missed springboard front flip splash ever. He fucking yeah. springboards. He goes like a thousand feet in the air. He still barely gets his ass over. <laughs> and he just crashes. Was it as funny as the time he tried this and almost went out the other side of the ring? <laughs> that was funnier. Okay. This is pretty funny, though. I forgot about that until right now. Anyway, yes. Uh, Glacier kicked one of them. And Ernest did a double jump kick off the top rope and pinned the other. That was so dumb. He's like facing one way. Mm-hmm. And then he jumps and he does a half turn. Yeah. And so he that he can jump does backwards. another half yeah. turn so that he can face the exact same direction he started in, and then he does his kick. Yeah. It's like a double trouble in paradise. It was just showing off. Yeah, it was dumb. But hey, guy looked all right. Glacier and Mortis ran down to ringside. Or excuse me, Wrath and Mortis. Correct my notes here. Terrible. Please. Terrible mistake. We do not want the figure four to be in an accurate record of this show from 19 years ago. Wrath and Mortis came down to ringside, but Glacier and Miller saw them coming, and they backed off. And a Hulk Hogan, Dennis Robin highlight video. It was all posing and mugging and making faces for the camera and doing having wacky costumes. Neat. <laughs> Dallas Page <laughs> versus Scott Hall. You know, Diamond Dallas Page was a really good worker, mm-hmm. and Scott Hall was a really good worker, mm-hmm. and they were both friends, and they had the most boring match. <laughs> I couldn't even believe it. How could this match have been this boring? I want to say, go ahead. All I can think is maybe they realized there's going to be a DQ finish. Who gives a shit? 
<laughs> no one's watching Raw. Well, there's that. Why? Why? I don't know. It was. It's just like I've never seen two friends who are good workers have a more boring match together. Seen it a hundred times. The brothers, though. Well, yeah, that's true. Actually, so six months ago, whatever it was, I was absolutely tearing Rick Bogner apart as for his performance of the fake Razor Ramon. After watching Razor for two weeks here, I can at least see what Bogner was going for. He was, in fact, doing a terrible Scott Hall impression. But I, I, Hall, when he's selling punches, he actually does have this little bird flapping thing he does. Now, Bogner took that and cranked it up to 24. But uh, I can at least see what he was trying to do. Other than that, yeah, nothing of note happened. Hall came out with Savage and Elizabeth. Paige sent Kimberly to the back. And Paige signaled for the Diamond Cutter. Savage attacked for the DQ. They're beating him up until Sting appears in the stands. He's pointing his bat at the ring. And they cut to a wide shot. Paige is down on the ring helpless. Scott Hall is standing over him. Randy Savage is on the top rope. Sting is yonder. 50 yards away or more and upstairs. He's pointing a bat at them and time freezes. I'm wondering, Randy, I guarantee if you jump and hit this elbow now, you will land before Sting hits the ring. You may have time to run up and hit another one. He did. He did, in fact, hit two elbows before Sting finally got down there. But he waited a long time to do it. Well, the story was he was hypnotized. I see. I don't know why. Yeah. So he had a couple elbows. Sting get the, hit the ring finally. So much garbage hitting the ring for all this, by the way. Which is funny. They didn't. They magically knew not to throw the garbage until the match had ended and Sting was there and stuff. They didn't throw the garbage when the NWO came out. So there is a long uh, stare down between Sting, Hall, and Savage. And just as the show ends, they hit the ring. He fought them off with his bat. And that was that. Such a boring show. It's kind of amazing. Like, the shows have been so good lately, and then one week they just are both boring as all hell. I don't even know why. There's just nothing to this. It happens. I guess so. Hopefully it will be better next time. We are at war! Okay. Nitro 94, June 30th, 1997. Now, this one was fun. I think I like this. Till the main event. Had some really bad matches on the show. <laughs> hey, but it had Ric Flair. That's true. And strippers. <laughs> you don't know what they. You don't know. Yeah, I do. It was strippers. in Vegas. They flat out said they were strippers. All right, fine. And as funny as one of the strippers cut a promo that was better than eighty percent of the people on Raw today. Somebody needs to kind smarten of. these strippers up. By well, the way. <laughs> okay. So Gene brings out Flair. Flair comes out with two lovely young women, as I wrote, and they have a mannequin wearing a kilt. And there's Roddy Piper's music playing. <laughs> Can I say something about the women real quick? I thought one of them was really, really hot. Mm-hmm. And then there was the other one. And there was another one that I didn't think was so hot. Right. Hmm. And I was kind of like, you're in Vegas, okay? Mm-hmm. And it's not like this woman wasn't hot, but it was like the other girl was like two or three times as hot. All right. And it's like, if you're in Vegas, like you couldn't find another one as hot as the first one. Well, I would imagine when they were in the club the night before and well, it was I'll dark. I'll explain. Okay. So I'm trying to figure out why they had the really, really hot one and the one that wasn't quite so hot. And so they do the whole segment here. And at the end of the segment, Rick leaves without the girls. And for reasons I cannot explain besides the obvious, the one that was not so hot just starts jumping up and down. And she jumped and jumped and jumped and jumped and jumped. And I was like, oh, I got it. Okay. Huh. Now, here's the thing. Do we need to add anything more to this? <laughs> Not really. Did anything constructive happen in this promo? Yeah, there was another great one. So <laughs> he's burying Roddy Piper. They've got a mannequin dressed up like Roddy. And they're they make, they're broke. Making, yeah, they're making fun of him. They broke it immediately. It dissolved, really. And so Gene's having the time of his life, because there's Ric Flair, two strippers in the ring. And so Gene goes <laughs> up... does sound fun, let's be honest. <laughs> Gene goes up to the one that's a good talker, and he says, So tell me, is he really a 60-minute man? And the one that is not so hot, she's just doesn't even know what the hell he's asking. She's like, what? Huh? And then the other one goes, more like 30 seconds. Yeah. Because she wasn't sure who she was supposed to be insulting. She thought that Gene was asking about Roddy, mm-hmm. but he was asking about Rick. So Gene has to save the day. And the best part was, Flair didn't even give no! a shit. No! <laughs> Why would he care? He did not <laughs> care one the ring. fucking bit. I'm going to do my joke about this kilt. He asked for a moment of silence. He makes a joke earlier about how Piper can't hang with two women, so he may as well just go back to his wife and kids. 
<laughs> After months and months where the storyline has been Flair and Piper partying with every girl they can find in every city in America. Well, to be fair, Roddy always talked about his family, but Flair was always telling him, forget your fucking family. Let's go party with chicks. And many times Piper did leave, say, okay, we'll go party with the chicks. Yeah, mm-hmm. now now Flair, with the, the way that Flair said the wife... With such disdain in his voice. <laughs> Just Buzz like, kill. wow. <laughs> wow. Hooven to Guerrero versus Chris Jericho. Oh, Hoovy. This, there is bad Hoovy and there is good Hoovy. This is not good Hoovy. No. Now, to be fair, Hoovy apparently bonked his head. And so the story was that he was a little bit out of sorts, and that's why he was missing all of these moves. Hmm. But the problem was, he was also hitting moves. So eventually, <laughs> I don't think you can completely attribute this to him bonking his head. Like the first six moves he tried, and I, I'm not joking. There was like six moves in a row where he fucked up everything. And I don't mean didn't get all of that one. I mean going for a springboard and falling on his face, or trying to do a flip and land on his feet and land on his belly instead, just crashing all over the place left and right. It's just a disaster. And. <laughs> Jericho was so great. Every time he'd screw up a move, Jericho would drop him on his head with another move. <laughs> you know what? I got I got to give Jericho credit. The last couple of weeks, Jericho has had his time cut, yeah. and something has gone wrong, and he's just panicked like That's a true. brand new green guy and done all sorts of weird shit that he never does. But here, Hoovy's fucking up shit left and right, and Jericho's a grizzled vet, <laughs> just carrying this guy through the match. Yeah. He did great in this match. So for the finish... Hoovy did recover. He had some. He had a four fifty splash or some things, but his batting average for this match was still very, 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 very poor. And Jericho takes him up top, and they are both standing in the top rope. And Jericho hits the top rope runner from there. I could not believe the giant balls in this man to try that move yep. mm-hmm. with this guy on this night. That was exactly what I was thinking. Holy Christ! Like if I had a match and a guy fucked up six moves in a row. And our finish was a top rope Frankensteiner. Audible. Backslide. <laughs> That's right. Let's you are getting backslid. Small package. <laughs> so instead he hits this move and he hooks the Boston Crab and he wins. That was nuts. Uh, we didn't even mention this. The internet show they did is the Saturday night prior in Los Angeles. Jericho had beaten six to win the uh, Cruiserweight title. So six comes out here. He insists he is still the champion. He runs He runs him down for a while, says, the only thing you beat that night was yourself later on in the hotel room. Gene says, you can't say that. And Six says, say what? And Gene just says, let's move on. So eventually a brawl breaks out and they go to commercial. Then they come back from commercial. The brawl is still going on. <laughs> and this was live, so this that is, was a long-ass brawl. A long, long brawl. And I kind of think... I don't know this, but I've heard stories like this happen. I would be inclined to believe they went into business for themselves. Let's go out there and brawl forever to ruin Alex Wright's promo. So they're in the ring fighting. Guys are trying to separate them. I like to say ruin. Well. Like Alex Wright had a great promo that he was in the middle of <laughs> well, that they had to cut away from. When you put it that way. But Alex has to do his promo on the floor with his back to the ring. With there's a brawl going on behind him. He's distracted. The fans are distracted. And eventually... Oakland essentially just says, fuck it, and leaves. Almost mid-sentence. Gene could not get the mic away from this guy fast enough. Yeah. We had Dean Malenko versus Eddie Guerrero. This goddamn match was so awesome. As far as, like, crispness, there's, like, one guy in WWE who might compare, and that's AJ Styles. Yeah. There is nobody else nowadays. These guys... Every move they do is perfect. And this match, I couldn't even believe how great... And this I don't think anybody would ever look at this and go, this was one of their best matches. No. But I sure did. I couldn't even believe how great it was. I thought it was one of those matches, which actually we see a lot these days, where they start at a very fast pace, they keep going at a very fast pace, then one guy cuts the other off, they keep going at a very fast pace, and they do a finish. So the finish here was Chavo comes out, to distract Dean, Eddie shoves Dean into Chavo, hits a brain buster and a frog, frog splash for the win. So that's our first distraction on Nitro. I'm doing a very poor, poor job of keeping track here. Jericho won clean. Nothing to keep track of there. So Eddie wins thanks to Chavo's uh, distraction. And that's the end of that. Dean hit a life-ending powerbomb to Eddie. Ed's got to stop taking those moves. Jeez. Yeah, that happened. 
Ray Jr. came out for a promo. He says he's sick of getting bullied by Kevin Nash. Who in the crowd was doing the goddamn bird whistle? I don't know. It was driving me nuts, too. Okay. Uh, are you like me where you thought it was a bird outside your house? I did for a while. Then okay. I realized it was on here, and okay. I was furious. Yeah. So he challenges Kevin Nash to a match, na- to a match tonight. And Nash comes out to answer. Oakland pleads this is not fair. But Nash accepts. Oakland tries to talk Ray out of it. And Ray is doing a very cheesy promo about how it's not about size. It's all about courage. And I'm going to prove I'm a man. And then Nash made fun of him for being lame. You know what? Ray was lame here. It was a fine promo. I mean, it wasn't great. Nope. Don't get me wrong. But nope. I've, heard, I've heard a lot of promos worse than this. Sure. Eric Bischoff and Hulk Hogan came out for a promo. <laughs> I watched a promo where Hulk Hogan cut a promo on Rey Mysterio. Yes. And where he talked about DDPP. Mm-hmm. Between him and Bret Hart. <laughs> also, Eric Bischoff was watching Raw and saw the DOA and said, I got an idea. I'm going to ride a motorcycle to the Somebody get me my bike. Also a real bike. So the, all he did, he hyped up his match with Robin against Luger and Giant. He ran down DDP. He said Nash is going to kill Mysterio. He vowed a party. He flexed for a while. A waste of time. He still had his clean-shaven, shoe-polished beard here. <laughs> and he's at one point, he's just, he's doing his flexing, and his head is, is like perfect sideways to the camera. You ever notice how pointy his chin is? I never did. No. He has a very pointy chin. Huh. Wow. It's a great villain, then. I guess so. Hector Garza versus Steven Regal. Not even Steve Regal could have saved this match. <laughs> so apparently the idea was that they wanted Hector Garza to learn to work American style. Well, he didn't. So I thought they'd put him in there with Regal. The European. European. And hopefully they had a long, multi-year feud planned. Because there's a long way to go. Now granted, not all of this was Garza's fault because he tried to do his tornillo dive off the post. And Regal was in a different area code. And he just... <laughs> fucking splatted on the ground second week in a row by the way he's missed the move completely yeah yeah. he's like wishing he was back in mexico where dudes caught you it's american bullshit where they run away this sucks (laughs) it was was for about two minutes hector was doing absolutely fine holding his own with regal's chain wrestling and then things all fell apart when he went to the floor yeah because he didn't have to do anything but hold on i guess so things fell apart when he went to the floor they had this spot where Regal would run at him and Hector would do a flip and they both froze. And then finally Hector does the flip and he lands on his feet and they freeze again. So Regal just starts walloping on him. <laughs> Hector missed his dive, splatted on the floor because Regal was, as Brian noted, far, far, far away. And then Hector tries a moonsault. Regal gets the knees up and he hooks in the Regal stretch. I mean, he hooks in mm-hmm. the Regal stretch. <laughs> and Hector submitted. As he should have. I described this as an entertaining train wreck. So we've talked before about Larry. And Larry gets in these moods where he's got to be the smartest guy in the room. So Larry's going on and on in this match about this fucking guy flying around. He's going to kill himself. And a high-flying guy is no match for a great mat wrestler. And so he's so proud of himself when Regal wins. So then that leads to the Steiners promo, which is basically the Steiners come out and they won a championship match. Hall comes out with a contract. And the Steiners go to sign it. And of course, Larry is like, you guys should get a lawyer to read this contract. You should make sure you get a lawyer. And of course, Larry is right. Because Larry knows everything. (laughs) Fucking drove me crazy on this show. I just like, the Steiners say, we were stripped of our titles. We still have not gotten a rematch. We want a title shot. The Outsiders and all their friends come out and say, okay, just sign here. The Steiners sign, and then they leave, and then the Outsiders reveal the contract states you get a title shot if you can beat Chono and Muda first. So in storyline, I emphasize this in case Scott and Rick are listening, in storyline, the idea is that the Steiners are morons. Yeah, basically. Okay. It couldn't even be a deal where the no. outsiders threw it out there and they said, well, take that challenge. We'll beat those Japanese guys and then beat you. Well, I think the idea is the Steiners are not so much idiots as they're just so determined to win. They don't give a shit what the contract says. It didn't come off that they're way. They're a little too trustworthy. It How about that? It did not come off that way. Jericho was backstage doing an interview with Mark Madden for the website. 
By the way, can you imagine if, they, if the roles would have been reversed and, like, the Steiners were the heels, and the storyline was that Hall and Nash were going to come out, and they were just going to blindly sign a contract like fucking morons, <laughs> and it would turn out that they were wrong? <laughs> I don't think it would come out that way. No, nah, I don't think so. Psychosis versus Super Kolo. In Kolo's first match back since the park, I put him in the hospital with a chair shot. <laughs> Maybe it is. Uh. Sonny Ono was in Psychosis' corner. He interfered to get the heat. Psychosis tries an axe handle to the floor. Kolo dodges. Psychosis ate this guardrail. Yeah. Just ate it. So Ono trips Kolo on a suplex. He kind of sort of holds his foot down. The ref kind of sort of counts three. The match is over. Kolo pops up. Well, the ninth time tonight, someone has popped up after getting pinned. They've been watching Raw. I guess so. <laughs> he goes after Psychosis. La Parker runs down with a chair. He breaks it over Kolo's back. Hooventude returns and makes the most luchific save he ever saw. At least hey, at least they're up here. Yeah, they're building up a program with the luchadors. As an interference finish on Nitro. Vicious and Delicious and Masachono <laughs> versus Ric Flair and Steve McMichael and Chris Benoit. What an amazing match. It was so good while it lasted. This actually was a tease. This felt like a like a trailer. Like here's a brief part of the match. You got to buy the pay per view to see the whole thing. But they're never going to do the whole thing. This was just it. It starts off with Flair and Bagwell, and the NWO are the company's top heels. And Ric Flair don't care. He's going to do a Ric Flair match, which means Bagwell's going to kick his ass for about three minutes straight, and he's going to look like a fool. So he tags out. He tags in Mongo, and Mongo was a wrestler of many weaknesses and many strengths. <laughs> but when he just gets in the ring. And eyeballs this pretty boy and is just ready to fight and smiles and his big, big smile. Oh, it was so great. And then sadly, Bagwell tagged right out. Then even more sadly, we had Chongo, Chono versus Mongo Chongo. for about three seconds. (laughs) It's a hell of a wrestling name. (laughs) Chongo. (laughs) Chono versus Mongo. And I was very, very excited. It lasted about three seconds. We had Chris Benoit running wild being a great professional wrestler. A six-way brawl breaks out. Vincent hits the ring for the DQ. That is an interference finish. While you're writing that down in your notes, Mm -hmm. you're a huge fan of Mongo in this match. I'm a huge fan of Mongo. I don't know how anybody could have possibly not liked Mongo. Fucking Vincent runs in and ruins a perfectly good match. Yeah. And so Mongo's job is to hit this guy with the briefcase. I can right. just imagine the people in the back going, okay, well, someone's got to hit Mongo. It's got to be Mongo. Or someone's got to hit Vincent. It's got to be Mongo. And they tell him, you hit Vincent with this briefcase. And boy, did Mongo, he hit this guy with the briefcase so hard that Mongo, I mean, Vincent, whatever this fucker's name is. Vince. Sent him, like, almost into the far wall of the arena. Mm. <laughs> he just fucking swung, and the dude goes flying. It was so... I love Mongo. This is the second week in a row that Vincent has had his hash settled. And he, That's true. he's like the fall boy for the NWO. <laughs> yeah. This guy was making so goddamn much money to do nothing, he could take a briefcase to the back. So this was odd and ultimately pointless. And a Chris Benoit, Kevin Sullivan hype video. It was very short and honestly not very good considering they had Chris Benoit highlights to work with. Short. Yeah. I see what you did there. Wrath and Mortis versus High Voltage. Do you see the comma kicks ass sign? Yeah. Comma had a fan. <laughs> Apparently that's the guy. I, mean, I saw the sign. Legitimately, I thought, there must be another comma. <laughs> I don't know where or who. Maybe they're just a big fan of punctuation. Wrath of Mortis versus High Voltage. And bad spelling. <laughs> so it's Ed. <laughs> there you go. Uh, the heels jump them at the bell. They beat them up for a minute until Glacier runs out to distract them. And then Ernest Miller interferes with a jumping kick. He knocks Mortis out. And brown-haired High Voltage makes the cover of the win. <laughs> Rage. That is a distraction and an interference. Vandenberg, he only has about 10 seconds. But he got the best 10-second promo he looks in the camera and says, Glacier, you and that karate punk will pay for this and you will pay dearly. You know, I got to say something. So when I was wrestling, wasn't making a lot of money <laughs> as an indie guy, you know. Tell me more. Yeah. But I would always I would always look at the managers and it'd be like, is this guy making the same or more than me? The answer is no. Because this fucker barely ever has to take bumps, if ever. And he just goes out there and talks. Like, what a gig. 
You look at these managers on WWE TV and you're like, is this guy really making six figures to be a manager? Are you kidding me? This last couple of weeks, as we watch NWA with Cornette and Paul Jones and J.J. Dillon in 86, not 96, and Vandenberg here and Paul Bearer, it's like I have such a new respect for these managers. Oh, yeah. Like a great manager earn like these managers that were great earn every fucking dime that they got, whether they ever took a bump or not. God, whatever happened to the manager? Yeah, sorely missing from wrestling now. Sorely missing. Couldn't agree more. Had a white limousine pull up backstage. A door opened, but the camera ran right up to the door and it slammed shut. Uh, Lee Marshall did the road report. I am now deaf to these. Have we mentioned Raven yet? Is that later? That's right here. Okay. Yep. They showed Raven. Time has not been kind to Raven. <laughs> no. No. Maybe it R- wasn't just time either. It, it, it's, it's a lot of what he did in that time, what he ingested in that time. No, uh, Raven in 1997 was incredibly cool looking. Raven in 2016 has had a hard life. So it's Raven, uh, fresh out of ECW, in the crowd doing the exact same character, exact same name, exact same look. He's just Raven. They say, is this the guy in the limo? Is this DDP's mystery partner? <laughs> yeah, he teleported into the fucking building <laughs> in the last the five impact seconds. Player? Well, there was a commercial break in there. Uh. Is this the impact player that's been advertised? Who knows? Jeff Jarrett versus Conan. <laughs> so anyway, after the match. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was uh, interference here when Flair helped. Yeah, I just realized this and how awful this is in hindsight. Flair helped Jarrett win. Okay. So Flair helps Jarrett wins. All the horsemen come out. Jarrett gets a promo and says, there was professional jealousy in the horsemen because Arn and Benoit and Mongo know I have beaten them, but I have never beaten Ric Flair. And I am a horseman because Rick says so. And then Flair says, you are no longer a horseman. So why did he help Jeff win? There's more on this, actually. Deborah tells Jeff, you're like a skunk because you stink. And Gene turns to him and asks, did you hear that? You stink. <laughs> so Jared grabs the mic and goes off and all I can think is dude you have been dumped walk away keep your dignity nope 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 he vows to put Flair out to pasture and then he just leaves and I was appalled you know what was weird about it was as he is cutting a promo on Flair Flair is just calmly walking around to the other side of the ring and so as Jared is talking to him, Jared ends up with his back to the rest of the horsemen. And I'm like, man, you're dead. That was a smooth move there, Rick. But then Rick just walks the other way and they don't attack Jeff Jarrett. I have no idea what happened here. We've been talking about how great the original horsemen were on those Saturday night shows. Here we are 11 years later and they have made an enemy and kicked him out of the horsemen and they let him walk away. Can well, you imagine if you got stabbed in the back by Ole Anderson, Ole sent a new home in an ambulance, period. Maybe there's more to come. Is Arn coming I back? I hope not. Soon? All right. Kevin Nash versus Rey Mysterio. I've been very critical of Nash in the past, but Nash did the coolest thing I've ever seen him do in his career here. When Ray is running wild on the guy and he goes for a sunset flip, which fails. And Nash reaches down and he grabs the guy by the neck and with no swing, with no help, he does a front barbell raise and lifts Ray all the way up over his head. Yes. I was like, holy by, shit. By the head. And then, I've never seen anyone do this before or since, he's got him up for like a tree slam. But then instead of dropping him all the way down to his back, he drops him into an atomic drop. Yeah. That was really cool. Yeah. Which is bad because Nash's leg, even bent, is still taller than Ray's leg. <laughs> well, he so did it's probably look- a shoot. <laughs> yes, he probably he- landed. He probably crossed himself on Nash's thigh. So Ray hits the ring at House of Fire, hits about eight drop kicks in a row, gets one near fall, places going nuts. He tries to do a lucha spin around thing. Nash hits him, does this tree slam atomic drop thing we talked about. He beeled Ray so high. If you're gonna do a giant versus little guy match, go ahead and do it. And he peeled Ray as high as he possibly could. He picked him up, power bombed him, pinned him with a foot in his chest. He gave him three power bombs before this was over, and every single one he let him down real good. Yes. 
Got to give him credit for that. Somebody since I talked chastised to him about last, last week, week. For almost killing him. Yes. So Conan appears on the stage and makes his way down to ringside. And uh, slowly, but he's making his way down. Tanae is reminding us that Conan and Ray have trained together in Mexico. Conan gets in the ring. Ray is down in the middle of the ring. And Nash and Conan are opposite corners. And Conan, with his back to the camera, he like, opens up his flannel shirt. And Nash nods at him and leaves. And I thought, oh, this is going to be awesome. And then Conan put Ray in a heel hook. And that was it. And I thought Conan would stand up and reveal the NWO shirt. But no. He just hates Ray. Well, he's in the NWO soon. Eventually, yeah. They go to break, and they come back. Ray is strapped to a stretcher, getting wheeled out. Mike Tanay attempted to interview Raven. Raven would not answer any of his questions. He would not even make eye contact with him. <laughs> and after about four questions, finally he pushes Tanay away, and that is that. I loved it because Tanay asks a question, he gets no answer. He asks a question, he gets no answer. He asks a question, he gets no answer. He asks a question, he gets shoved away. They go back to Bobby Heenan, who says some of the effect of, way to take a hint, Tanay. <laughs> it was true. Main event was Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, and Randy Savage versus DDP, Lex Luger, and Giant. Hideously boring. Nothing to it. Okay, th- it was, but think about how much this would have been if you were actually watching this live pre-DVR in 1996. The NWO guys come out. Nash is wearing a wig for no reason at all. <laughs> this takes probably two minutes when all is said and done. Then they go to commercial. Then the baby faces come out one at a time, and they get the ringside, and they surround the ring, and there's a stare down. Then they go to commercial again. There had to be a legit 10 minutes of real life time between the start of the Outsiders entrance and the actual match beginning. Everyone pairs off. Everyone brawls everywhere. It's very boring, as Brian noted. Hogan comes out. Starts whacking dudes with a title belt. <laughs> let's let's not gloss over Hulk Hogan giving Lex Luger the weakest belt shot to the back I've ever seen. It's not even like he hit the guy in the head. My baby eats and I burp the baby. I know I hit the baby harder than Hulk Hogan hit Lex Luger with this fucking belt to the back. Yeah, I respect that. <laughs> so Hogan is whacking guys with the belt. A man who is not in the match and is using a weapon, but it's outside the ring, so I guess it's okay. This goes on for a while. Giants down, Luger's down. All the NWO guys come out. They're beating up those two on the floor. So Paige is now in the ring getting triple teamed, but he's getting triple teamed by the guys who are in the match. So like, okay, fine. And then Hog- uh, Nash somehow gets his hands on the title belt and is hitting Paige in the ribs with the belt right in front of the ref. Not a DQ. I give up. I don't know what the rules are in 1997 anymore. I don't know how you lose. I don't know how you win. What the hell was the finish? Oh, they did one. Are we sure the match even started? It might be still going. I'm kidding. That was an interference finish. <laughs> I don't think it started. <sighs> Savage is dropping elbows <laughs> on page forever. The fakest sting in the history of fake stings appears in the crowd. It's Canyon. This was so unnecessary. The first one. One of them may have been Canyon. One of them was a nine-year-old boy. <laughs> he was young looking. Skinny. Yeah, guy's eighty pounds. In hindsight, the the fake sting was so unnecessary. It, well, I know what they were going for, but they put, they did, they did it so badly because a fake sting appears. Right, they shoot him. Place goes nuts. Then they shoot back to the ring. Announcers, by the way, look at this preposterous fake sting. Yes, and they think it's a real deal. Right, I know who it was. It had to be Kidman. <laughs> it's like Kidman here was super skinny. Had that dumb bowl haircut. There it is. That had to be Kidman. Are you sure there were two fake stings? I was positive. I only saw one, and I know I, I know the one, one that was show. in there was Canyon. I'll go back and rewatch this. I'm almost positive because the way it looked to me, like the camera shot the fake sting, then they went to the ring, and then the camera went to another part of the arena. I could have sworn. Maybe, perhaps I'm wrong. I've been mistaken. He before. was like in the he was like in the hallway or something, like uh, in the stands in the hallway kind of thing. Yeah, yeah that's the one I saw. Yeah, go back and watch this. Regardless, the announcers thought it was one fake sting. Or actually, they thought it was the real sting. And then the real sting dropped down from the ceiling. He chased all the NWO guys, NWO guys away. Kurt Hennig comes walking down the aisle in a blue suit. Raven jumps the guardrail. Everyone looks at each other, and the show just ended. So we had new names. Still didn't know what side of the war they were on. Still better than Raw, I wrote. Between these two shows, we had four distraction finishes and ten interference finishes. 
I suppose if you compare it to today, like if Raw just ended with a horrible brawl, but then like Finn Balor walked out, and then you had Samoa Joe sitting in the crowd, I mean, that would be pretty awesome. But watching this show, man, I was like, this is boring. Raven and Kurt Hennig, who fucking cares? <laughs> Maybe it was cool at the time, but uncool here. That was the show.